too much. Good evening. Let's call the uh, December combined study session regular meeting to order. All the board members are present. Uh, welcome to our many visitors. If you'll please stand and join us for the pledge. Once again, some impressive students to uh, recognize tonight. So, uh, Dr. Harrell, you're up. Good evening, Mr. President, members of the board, and thank you for having me here again this evening uh, to celebrate some of our outstanding students. We have two high schools represented this evening. We're going to start off uh, recognizing a young lady by the name of Nancy Fairbanks. She is here with her parents. Uh, she has had an outstanding opportunity to perform at the Ronald Reagan great communicator debate series. And uh, so we're going to have Dr. Snodgrass step up and introduce her to a little bit more about that situation. Dr. Snodgrass. Well, this was a huge honor. And um, I don't know a lot about it, but I'm going to have Nancy explain it. But I know there were, uh, first of all, this is uh, her parents, Judy and Zeke Fairbank, and this is oh. Nancy. Uh, there were seven regions across the country, and there were winners of those regions that uh, were then flown to California to debate at the Ronald Reagan Library, okay? And um, so Nancy got all the way there, got second place in the country, but it was a split vote, okay? Um, <laughs> she, um, she won $8,000. You know, I get to the the important stuff. She won $8,000 and she gets to attend a leadership thing at a, at a university this summer. So I'll let her talk about what she, her experience a little bit and what it's meant to her and then go from there. So this is Nancy. Okay, go ahead. She's a debater so she can talk. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was an incredible experience to get to participate in, and I generally do public forum debate with a partner, so this type of debate, it was singular, you were on your own, and it was different than anything I'd ever done before, but it was set up by the Annenberg Foundation and the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library in order to get students kind of interested and involved in government. So we started off by doing seven competitions across the nation, as Dr. Snodgrass said, and then there was also an online region, which was very interesting, but they did one online. But I went to the central one at, held at University of Notre Dame, and our topic there was on mandatory national service. So we all debated that, and then they took the winners of each of the seven regions in the nation and the online region in order to fly them out to California, and we got to debate at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. And I had never been to California before, so it was very impressive that that was the first place that I ever got to go there. I'm sure there are not so good parts, but that was the best. So. <laughs> It was an excellent experience, and then our topic for that was the balanced budget amendment and whether we should add that to the Constitution. So we debated that. It was really incredible to get to meet the other young debaters there. They were all spectacular people, and I had a lot of fun. Um, and my coach, Jack Tuckness, went. He's been very supportive of the debate program at Central and has really run an excellent program there. And so we debated that, and then uh, we got to final round, which was awesome. And I got to debate under the wings of the old Air Force One that they have at the library. So there's this huge intimidating plane where I get to debate, <laughs> which is a little scary. But uh, it was an excellent experience overall, and definitely something that I hope that future students in Springfield can do. Nancy, don't go away yet. Nancy, don't, don't go away yet. We may, have, we may have questions for you. Anybody have any? Uh, Andy. Okay. Yep. Nancy, when did you start debating? Just when you got into high school? <coughs> yes. Um, there is a really interesting Midler debate program at Central, and I was a Midler, so I could have done that, but I started my freshman year as a novice. Right. And your plans after Central? Well, <laughs> college applications are due at the end of this month, <laughs> which is very stressful, but I, it depends on where I get in. While I was in California, I visited Stanford, which was beautiful, and I'd love to go there. And then there's um, a university in Texas that I really like, so maybe one of those two options, and I, I would like to study law, so. Right, great. Congratulations. Uh, Andy, go 
would say. Your mother can't, con your mother can't convince you to go into medicine. Right? Okay. I see all the paperwork she does. I'm like, who'd want to do that? <laughs> well, and, and to, uh, to uh, your parents, um, congratulations, because they've been here before, and you all must be doing something right in your house, because we, uh, we've, we've seen you here many times. Congratulations to all three of you. Thank you. Thanks. We also have uh, three other groups to celebrate this evening, HTV, Central Intelligence, and Central Journalism, all of which who attended the Journalism Education Association award ceremony in San Antonio, Texas this last, earlier this fall, and all of which have won national recognition. Uh, we have had both Central Intelligence and HTV here before for the exact same award. And so to some extent it may seem a little bit, I won't say like a broken record, but like a re repetition. But it's important to understand that every year this starts off brand new and as a whole clean slate. And to have two programs that together carry 16 pacemaker awards is just incredible. They are nationally renowned, they are modeled, and um, they need to be celebrated every single time. So we're very excited to have them back. We also have, uh, again, Dr. Snodgrass, which will be representing uh, Central High School, and Mr. Gary Moore. This is Mr. Moore's first time to publicly visit with the board, so feel free to ask him several questions and put him on the spot. So, Mr. Moore and Dr. Snodgrass, if you'd step up, please. I'll go ahead and get it over with. I <laughs> uh, want to thank you for having us out. One of the good things about coming to a, a, a new position is that sometimes you get to inherit some things, and we've really inherited a great group uh, and program at Hillcrest. Uh, I brought Sheridan Turner with me. Uh, she's one of our co-sponsors and a couple of our students. I'd like to bring them up real quick to explain the programs and the awards. Well, we're really excited to be here tonight. This is our 12th pacemaker. Um, I'm telling you what, every, every year I've watched the program grow. Uh, and it's just, it's just an honor to be part of this program. I couldn't ask for better kids, and I feel like in some ways I've inherited that from Coach Davis, but um, nevertheless, they're, they're mine too. So uh, before I go on and on and on about these kids, I'll let them say a couple of things. I brought with me Lexi Bryan and Ryan Lindsay. They're gonna talk to you about some of uh, those that are non-returners that have graduated and those that are still with a program that couldn't be with us tonight. Hi, as Ms. Turner said, I'm Lexi Bryan. I'm one of the four returners at Hillcrest. Last year, we had a staff of mainly seniors. Again, there was four juniors on that staff. So it was very experienced staff, and we were lucky enough to get another pacemaker. And here is my pal, Ryan Lindsay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ryan. Um, yeah, HTV has been like, like, I don't know, it's just, like, lots of people in high school, like, they find, like, their, like, home, I guess, in, like, sports programs or speech and debate or something, and I'm, like, I'm not good at talking in front of people, and I'm not, like, I'm the most unathletic person in the world. <laughs> so, like, HTV was just, uh, finding that was, like, just a really good thing for me personally, and, um, yeah, just, like, this year, like, there is only four returners, and that's just been... Another, like a great experience within like a separate great experience because it's really like we have had to really like step up our game and like lead everybody else a lot and so that's taught me a lot not just about like media and journalism but also about like leadership and that sort of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions or comments for the central uh, group, for the Hillcrest group? I just want to kind of walk us through the pacemaker, and we hear a lot about it. And we've 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 heard how you win it, but what is it? How many schools win it, and how do you win it? Um, as I know of, basically what we do is we there's a bunch of different like pacemakers you can win, and what we enter in is the monthly pacemaker because every year or every school year we do a bunch of monthly shows, and so what our pacemaker was made of of different like we selected stories out of every of the month shows the stories that, that were our best and we um we line produced it all together and we entered it when is the pacemaker i'm not sure when you enter it june june 19th, june 19th. Yeah. 
And um, as far as I know, there hasn't the pacemaker hasn't been long around long, but we have won 12, 12, 12, pa- 12. yeah, twelve pacemakers, and I think that's more by far than any other school in the country. So that's that's the most I know about it. <laughs> Any, oh, I would like to recognize Brianna Feimster and Kaylee Pryor. They're also other returners, but they were both sick tonight, so they're not here. It was about 14. Morgan. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, also recognized was the news director Morgan Wilson, line producer Brad, and, and line producer Brad Thomas. Thank you all very much. Okay, central group, come on up. Mr. Thomas, Ms. Garner, and uh, we have uh, the CI group, Central Intelligence, and a new sponsor this year, actually, you know, as the district uh, is going into the uh, e-learning, uh, stole Nicole Lemon from us, so we surviving, but uh, uh, Curtis Thomas is the new uh, teacher and sponsor of Central Intelligence, and in fact, Curtis is a graduate of Coach Davis's HTV, oh, huh. and uh, just like Nicole Lemon was. So um, we were very fortunate to have his expertise and background uh, coming from that uh, arena and now over to Central. And of course, um, he uh, landed obviously in a good spot with some returnees uh, from last year's staff and some new ones as well. So I'll let, uh, who wants to go first? I'll let Curtis go first. Uh, Curtis is gonna talk about uh, the awards that uh, CI one at San Antonio. Um, yeah, it's, it's strange. I was a part of HTV and, and CI was kind of our, our rivals a little bit here in town. And I would have never guessed I'd be actually leading Central Intelligence uh, at any point, but it's, it's an honor to be with this group of kids. They're, they're a bunch of great kids. Um, so we went to the, the JEA and SPA convention in San Antonio uh, last month. Um, we won our fourth pacemaker award um, that they, they announced that while we were down there. Um, we also won a story of the year in the news category. Um, we won second place story of the year in sports and third place in feature. Um, and then we also won best of show while we were down there at the convention. Uh, and best of show is we, we kind of, it's similar to the pacemaker, but you're competing with the schools at that convention. Uh, you, you put your best show together and you submit it before you head down there and they judge out of the ones that have been submitted, which one is, is the best out of the selection. Uh, and then we won a number of individual awards. They have a bunch of individual contests uh, that we comp- competed in while we were down there, uh, including four superior awards, which is the highest honor an individual can receive, uh, eight superior, I'm sorry, eight excellent awards, and seven honorable mentions. Uh, So they worked extremely hard. Uh, Yeah, I I can't really take much credit. They they knew their stuff coming into this, and and they've been a big help for me, you know, as I'm kind of learning the ropes, but um, they put a lot of hard work and, and did a great job while they were down there, so. You could have your students just say oh. their names. That'd be great. Sure. And if you guys want to step up. Pam, you can come Hello. Um, my name is Pamela Morris, and I'm the news director for this year's staff. Oh, this year's Tyler. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, this is Tyler Hines. He is the creative director. This is Bailey Mittman, um, Adam Weddle, Kenzie Inman, Jeffrey Klein. Don't raise your hands. Just <laughs> <laughs> um, Kathy Lee, Emily O'Reilly, Evan Peters. And uh, there's about 27 um, on our staff this year, um, but not all of them could make it, but we tried. <laughs> but um, as, can I say this? Go ahead. <laughs> um, as Mr. Thomas said, um, he was new this year, and uh, Miss Lemon was our former advisor. So she was the one that kind of really built up this program. Um, but this year, since we had a new advisor, it was a really big transition. But. Uh, Mr. Thomas was really great in helping us. It takes a kind of person to lead uh, a media class, and this he was really great in it. So um, he needs to take some of the credit for the awards we've won. But 
Um, this year, since Ms. Lemon was gone, uh, the students really had to step up. So um, as Ryan <laughs> from Hillcrest said, that this uh, participating in broadcast journalism really teaches students um, leadership and it teaches public communication. And it's one of, I think, it's become one of the most important classes that I've ever taken. Because not only have I learned how to um, report the news and to make stories, and I've learned how broadcast journalism works, I've learned how to deal with people, and I've learned how to form connections with the public, with businesses, and how to speak with people, and how to meet deadlines, and put effort in <coughs> when times are tough. It's really hard sometimes, but um, this year we've all worked really hard um, to make the show, and it was an honor and a surprise to win number one in the nation again. And so that was um, one of the best things we could have done this year. So I think uh, it was a little iffy coming into the year because we didn't know what to expect, but I'm glad that at the end of this year we can say that we um, did our best and we can be proud of what we've done. So thank you for uh, recognizing us. Also at this same convention, our, our print journalism students were there, and Deb Garner uh, is our journalism sponsor for the yearbook and the uh, newspaper, and she has a student with her. Go ahead, Deb. First, I'd like to say that I and the other broadcast teacher know how much time <laughs> and effort and aggravation that Curtis puts in, so I want to congratulate him as a first-year teacher. Um, I've done this 27 years and I know the heartache and all of that. So I may do print instead of broadcast, but congratulations to you. Um, my student who won a national award is Zach Lamar, and he was selected um, as a finalist. There were 12 in the country for cartooning and um, comic strips. And Zach has continued in his position of last year. It was a cartoon from last year as the graphic designer for the Central High Times. And we loosely call it newspaper, but it's really developed into a news magazine now. Um, it's four color and in, in that magazine style. And um, last year we lost 14 seniors and about that many the year before. So uh, for us too, it was a year of starting over and retraining. and. The students do a lot of that coaching of each other, and Zach is very effective at that, and I'm really proud of the skills that he's learned since Journalism won. Um, so he won second place in the nation for his um, satirical kind of editorial <coughs> cartoon style. Um, I asked him to project it and show you, but um, it was uh, James Cameron in his little bottom of the ocean um, submarine <laughs> assessing all of the world's problems that were on the bottom of the ocean floor. And it was r really cool. And he got some um, very flattering comments from the national judges. And his category was judged by Universal, the syndication of the Peanuts, Dear Abby, Ann Landers, all of those major syndicated um, parts of your newspaper that you see every day, they were the judges for this contest. So to me, that's even more prestigious. It wasn't just a bunch of journalism teachers, but these professionals. So I'm quite proud of him. And this year, he started kind of a new slant for cartooning. He's decided to do a cartoon strip. And the main characters are central teachers who have become superheroes with special <laughs> powers. And it's very entertaining and very professionally drawn. And I'm, I, I, I can't wait to see it when he gets it all put together because it's really well done. And we have a paper coming out Friday with some excitement. <laughs> so uh, we're looking forward to everybody seeing his work again. So congratulations. for being here and as, as we know you have homework feel free to uh, bail out at this point uh, mrs. Callan it's just a comment um, at an, on a night that we're going to be reviewing our activities and athletics um, program it just uh, this just reinforces to me the importance of having 
uh, such um, depth in what we offer to our students, and one of the students alluded to it, so that um, every student can find a way to be involved <coughs> extracurricularly because it's so important. So I just thought that that was a nice uh, mm -hmm. segue into what we're going to be talking about later. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any board members have any modifications to tonight's agenda? Good. Um, I'm going to uh, wisely cede my time on the president's report to our guest speaker of the evening, um, a, a good friend to the school district and to Springfield in general, Jim Anderson, who's the executive director of the Springfield Area Chamber of Commerce. He's also, he also serves, he served on many different things, including the Missouri Department of Transportation, and he's serving now in the Missouri Tax Credit Review Commission. And uh, it's a mouthful, Jim. I know you're up to the task, and we're awaiting your enlightening thoughts. Dr. Prater, thank you, ladies and gentlemen of the Board of Education. Dr. Ritter, uh, I will tell you, I've had a flashback this evening. Mm -hmm. uh, some of you know my background is education. Uh, in my previous life, I was a school a teacher and school administrator. Still have a lifetime uh, secondary uh, teaching degree. I keep waiting for Dr. Harold to hire me, but uh, it hasn't <laughs> happened yet. But I'll continue to wait. And, uh, and the four years I served in school administration, I attended every Board of Education meeting and with the Jefferson City Public Schools. So I uh, attended a lot of board meetings for a lot of years. So literally, it's been like a flashback, a pleasant flashback uh, this evening. And certainly, Janet and I are very proud parents of two Springfield Public Schools graduates, oldest daughter from Central and youngest daughter from Glendale. So SBS, uh, yes, very much part of our family. I am not a tax attorney. <coughs> And certainly, uh, I don't know all the details about every tax credit in the state of Missouri, but I do have a pretty good working knowledge, I think, of tax credit reform proposals. And I know it's been adopted as your top legislative priority for this next session, and certainly it's a legislative priority of the Springfield Area Chamber of Commerce as well. And as Dr. Prater uh, mentioned, I am part of the Tax Credit Review Commission, 27 of us who uh, were appointed in 2010 to review the state's current tax credit programs and make recommendations for greater efficiency and enhanced return on investment of state tax dollars. Uh, we're a diverse group, business, uh, community representation, education is very well represented, Missouri School Boards Association, Missouri Association of School Administrators, the teacher groups as well, labor is on the group, as well as legislators, both members of the Missouri State Senate and the Missouri House of Representatives. Our first report we issued just two years ago, November of 2010, and then the governor reactivated us uh, in September of this year. In fact, we finalized our report just last Friday. Uh, we had about a four-hour uh, meeting, and we will submit that to the governor later this week. So it's very timely, uh, I guess, for me to be here. Let me provide some context, and then I'd be certainly uh, more than willing to try to address whatever questions you might have. There are 61 tax credits in the state of Missouri that we looked at. Tax credits have been growing at an annual rate of 17% annual rate of 17 percent. Most recent a year, 629 million w was redeemed. That comes off the top. There's no legislative oversight. There's no debate. It's not subject to appropriations uh, review. It comes off the top. And as you well know, that's a significant amount of dollars. In fact, if it continues growing at this rate in just a couple of years, you can do the math, it will equate, if not surpass, total state support for higher education. As a percent of net general revenue, to give you some context, in 98, it was 1.7%. Today, it's 8% of net general revenue. I would tell you that not all tax credits are created equally. Uh, I'm very, uh, uh, very much aware, of course, of the economic development tax credits. We deal with those all the time in our job. We focus on return on investment. And quite frankly, those probably have the greatest ROI to the state of Missouri. Our recommendations in 2010, we're refining some of those now uh, for the 2012, is uh, eliminate or not uh, reauthorize 25 of those 61 tax credits. We also recommend a per periodic uh, legislative review. Right now, there's no review. Uh, let's bring some accountability to those tax credits. We recommend clawbacks, and that simply means on those performance-based credits, if you don't do what you say you're going to do, then you're going to return that money state of Missouri. And we also are recommending, and of course all of this is controversial, but the statutory caps are perhaps the most controversial. If those recommendations would be adopted, 
by the Missouri, Missouri General Assembly and signed by the governor, we're talking about $250 million right now. $250 million of immediate savings. You know and I know that the two large ones and the most controversial around the state, and certainly in our community, are historic and low income. Uh, let me reemphasize again and again, we're not recommending elimination of those tax credits. No one is recommending you eliminate those tax credits. They're great tax credits. They've done tremendous benefit in our community and all over the state. But in this economic climate, and in this state budget uh, situation, there needs to be some review of those two credits alone. For example, Historic did not have any cap at all, and about four years ago was capped at $140 million per year. Our recommendation uh, two years ago was to lower that cap to $75 million. The recommendation, and I guess you sort of get a preview of this, because the governor will see it, don't tell the governor please, in advance, <laughs> but uh, the recommendation is going to be $90 million. So we've tried to reach some compromise, and I will tell you we've worked with historic developers all over the state uh, to get to that $90 million. And I, I can't speak for every historic developer, but I think you will find that community uh, willing to look at that compromise. Low income, again, the second uh, one that's fairly controversial. Again, tremendous benefit to that tax credit. We're not recommending elimination. Great benefit in our community and other communities around the state. It's been at $195 million a year, so you again can do the math, you know, almost $350 million just on those two tax credits. Uh, in 2010, uh, we had recommended uh, an $80 million cap, huge change. The recommendation we're making right now is for $135 million. And again, we've worked with low-income developers all over this state. I hope this is a compromise position that's going to work. I will tell you, in fact, we uh, hosted the new speaker of the Missouri House of Representatives at 3.30 this afternoon. You're hearing everyone talk about tax credit reform right now. The stars are starting to align. I think you're going to see some very good bipartisan support for tax credit reform in 2013. Everybody's talking about it. The focus is there, and for the right reasons. The challenge is obviously where you end up in terms of that uh, final number and what kind of reform measures are there. But I will tell you, I, I am optimistic that we're going to see something happen because I do think there is truly bipartisan support Obviously, Tom Dempsey has talked about that with the caucus, the supermajority, and the Senate, and certainly Tim Jones is talking about that with the supermajority in the House. It's a priority of the governor, probably the number one priority of the governor. I want to believe that your number one legislative priority will see success in 2013. I'd be happy to address what questions you might have. Again, uh, didn't get down in the weeds or too much uh, in the detail. Uh, I tried to keep it more at a, a high level this evening. Count. Jim, has there been, it's my understanding that um, developers can actually piggyback, I mean, they can stack. Oh, stacking. Stacking, yes. Yeah. yes. Um, uh, is, has the um, task force addressed any of those recommendations? Recommended eliminating stacking, and also on the historic, especially what I would call small, small project exemption, which is great for rural Missouri, mm -hmm. and that is that up to five million can be exempted, doesn't count against the cap, and that benefits primarily rural Missouri. And I think uh, both of those recommendations, uh, again, have been some compromise that hopefully will work. But stacking has been a very controversial issue. We're <coughs> recommending stacking not be allowed. Because it's also my understanding that some of these tax credits are also eligible for federal. That's correct. But so you can stack literally all the way through. Okay, thanks. Currently. Mr. Hosmer. Jim, did any of the recommendations that you make, uh, you read stories, and I come from Marshfield, and, and we had an in situation where business comes in and gets tax credits for 10 years and hires people for 10 years and year 11 they leave Marshfield and you read stories across the nation of businesses coming in with economic development tax credits for 10 years getting those 10 years and they're gone is there any of the recommendations that addresses that in any way I know you talked about the clawback yeah, th that is one, certainly, uh, that if you don't do what you say you're going to do, you return that money. The other is most of the economic development tax credits by design, Andy, are performance-based. In other words, you don't get the credit until you do what you say you're going to do. Now, will that prevent someone from leaving after 10, 15, 20 years? Probably not. But it's the best accountability I think you can probably do under certainly uh, legal, uh, legal restraints. I, I'm a fan of performance-based credits. Uh, 
uh, and not all the credits have certainly been that way before, but Missouri Quality Jobs, for example, and Enhanced Enterprise Zone are two that we deal with all the time. Build is another. They're all performance-based credits. You don't get the credit until you create the jobs you say you're going to do or do the capital investment. And, and the basic idea behind all of these tax credits, is my understanding, and you can tell me if I'm right, is this wouldn't be done. It needs to be done, and it but wouldn't for. be done but for Absolutely. this help. And I Absolutely. guess that's kind of where sometimes we have a, a question. I have a question of, really? That wouldn't be done but for? I agree. And, and sometimes we lose sight of that but for provision. But absolutely, that is inherently, uh, it should be the crux of tax credits. And again, I think you focus on ROI. And you have this remedy model that all tax credits use. So you can determine ROI. We literally have gone through every 61 tax credit. We can tell you there are some that aren't returning the investment to the state like others. And I think you need to focus as you look at legislative review and accountability on return on investment. We have to do that in our own lives. Why shouldn't uh, that be a case uh, there, too? Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. I get a couple questions. And I would, one is, I guess the first one would be, how do we protect or, or the, the, the Review Commission, some of the term benevolent tax credits that do tremendous good but aren't, it's difficult to do return on investments, but are things that need to be done for the community and sort of keep the splatter effect of, dealing with the ones that really need um, even more scrutiny from a return on investment without sacrificing some of those that we <laughs> that really need to be done because that's good for the community and, and I guess that's one fear I've got as we as we go through this process we start throwing the baby out with the bath water don't when think we that really happen I'm okay I, and you heard I know me we last lost a few Thursday a few and I'm gonna say it again I'll get in trouble for it but it was irresponsible for the General Assembly to allow benevolent tax credits to expire it got caught up in political squalor. Quite frankly, nothing has happened in the last three or four years as it relates to tax credit reform because of, of and it, it's not so much partisan, because frankly, most of this is within the same parties. But it's just the political squalor and, and a lot of uh, agendas and special interest always seems to be the case in the political process. But the benevolent tax credits are such a small part, like 1% of the total. Yeah. And it makes such a difference, obviously, uh, around the state. Uh, look in our own region, the difference it's made. So, as you know, Senator Dixon has pre-filed a bill. I think there'll be widespread bipartisan support. I think it will happen to restore the benevolent tax credits like one or less than 1% of the total. I just hope they don't use them as hostage. I don't think they will. They have before, I, I, I but we've changed some personalities. Sure. Don't ask me to name names, but we've changed some personalities, and I think uh, it will not be held hostage. The, the, the second question, and it, this is probably maybe not a fair one because I'm not sure you guys talked about it, but did you address any of the two and a half billion dollar liability that we've got out there that haven't been redeemed yet. I mean, that's a huge hit over the next, <coughs> maybe the next five years. We have. It was that part of the scope of the of the commission? As it was not, it certainly was part of the discussion and it's, it is scary. Now, a lot of those will never be redeemed. Yeah. And that's the question mark, because most are historic and low income, quite frankly. And uh, that's the question mark is what the redemption will be. So when no one really knows, and that's also a little scary, but yes, there's a, li there's a potential liability out there that's pretty significant. But that was not within our purview, but it's, uh, and frankly, I don't think a lot of people even know that liability exists. I think you're exactly right. It, and, and I appreciate your <coughs> effort and the time you guys spend on, on this. <laughs> I know it's gotta be a, you hear school board's a thankless job sometimes. I, I can't imagine sitting up there and dealing with what you're doing in, in a situation like that. So I certainly appreciate your effort and others that are doing that and you know we keep talking about tax increases and stuff like that we have a solution right there if we would just would do agree. what what your commission has recommended uh, we solve some significant revenue problems and I would also tell you your your associations were well represented whether it be school board association or school administrators whether it be MSTA or, or MNEA or AFT uh, the representatives were, were great, and everybody took a big picture view. And quite frankly, I didn't, I didn't think we would get anything accomplished because there were uh, users of tax credits, recipients of tax credits. There were folks who were getting burned. I, you, you, had, you had a real hodgepodge, and everybody really uh, rose above all that and said, what is best for the state of Missouri uh, in, a great, in a much greater way, frankly, than I thought would happen. And you're 
education-related groups were great representatives uh, on that uh, commission. Will you, will you recommend any sunsets provisions? Uh, we will not, Dr. Prater. And let me tell you what we're doing here. That was a lightning rod in 2010, mm -hmm. especially with historic and low-income developers, if I can be so bold to say that. We are not recommending sunset this time, but we are recommending what I think could be the same thing, but it's all about language. We're recommending that periodic legislative review for accountability. But we're not using the word sunset, which was a lightning Maybe rod and hurt in 2010. Well, obviously, we're on the we're on the same page with you on this issue. The the impact to to um, K twelve education funding could be huge if if this money uh, uh, were to be redirected. So, thank you and the commission for your work. And, and I think we'll be talking and have already talked to our legislative representatives. We'll be meeting uh, next week, I guess, with them again. So, uh, we appreciate it. And I appreciate the board having this as your number one legislative priority because. A lot of local groups especially are focusing on this like we never have before, and it will make a difference. Well, you told us to. We pay attention. <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much. I better leave my eye my head. Thank you. Jim, thank you very Jim, much for your time. Jim, uh, congratulations to the Chamber, by the way. National Award, Chamber yes. of the Year. Congratulations. Yes, absolutely. Jim, I'll need your resume. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Uh, Dr. Ritter, your superintendent's report. Really, it just basically to remind everybody that uh, we're finishing the semester before the holiday. I think that's the first time, Bruce, help me. I think that's the first time we've ever done that. And I think we have some kids that are numb a little bit, but uh, realizing they have exams coming up right, right now. So anyway, uh, just a little bit of a reminder on that. So, okay. Thank you. That's all, because we have plenty coming. We do have a lot to, to do. I think uh, next would be public comments to address agenda items. And I don't believe, Ms. Luton, we have any speakers. Okay. So let's move on to uh, information items and the ongoing systems review. Uh, let me remind everybody that um, we'll uh, try to spend seven to ten minutes or as much time as needed on each, uh, each one of the review reports. And then immediately afterwards, we'll have a, a short discussion on the process and do a bit of plus delta. Dr. Goodman. Good evening. It's my pleasure to bring to you tonight the first ongoing systems review summary report. Uh, and this is for the month of December. Uh, tonight's presentation, uh, we have kind of to serve a couple of purposes. One, this being the first time out, we need to just briefly uh, cover kind of how we got here and what the process looks like uh, to bring you what you're receiving this evening, and then also set up the process for bringing the reviews forward, as well as then, uh, as Dr. Prater referenced, uh, setting up a plus delta process at the end for not only the report, but also the process we're using this evening. We want to shape it as we go along uh, and certainly gather your input uh, along those lines. So for this evening, uh, from the process piece, we'll review, be reviewing these processes um, related to this ongoing systems review. Uh, the programs coming forward reflect programs that came through in the month of November to Cabinet. So thus the December report reflects the programs Cabinet has uh, had come through in the month of November. Those include risk management, community relations, health services, athletics and activities, professional learning, and special education. And then, as previously mentioned, we will talk about the um, strengths and opportunities related to the report, re related to the materials received, and the presentation. So I thought it important to frame it back around purpose. Uh, and this purpose is whenever we went about from moving from this program evaluation structure to the ongoing systems review. And as we visited with Cabinet as we talked with the lead team, as we uh, got input from the board, really identified that the purpose of an ongoing systems review, or OSR as we've abbreviated it, we're, we're good at creating acronyms and thus we have a new one to add to our lexicon, is to provide the superintendent's cabinet a standardized ongoing update to the goals, targets, and key drivers to SB5 at the program or what we might otherwise know it as the department level. Additionally, then, Cabinet would go about using a defined protocol to review these evaluations and use the findings from the reviews to make policy and budgeting recommendations to the Board of Education. The second piece will come as we fully go through the process. Um, Cabinet is, does use a defined protocol in terms of how we go about viewing them. Um, the second piece kind of puts, from the program reviews, puts them on the radar right now in going forward to those more formal processes. When we think about the process, 
uh, we had a, a series of steps, and I thought it was important just to briefly walk through those. So SPS had identified this need for a redesign of the program evaluation process a little over a year ago. Uh, in November through July of 12, a project work team uh, consisting of myself, uh, Rod Owen, coordinator of custodial services, who is uh, here with us this evening, as well as a uh, math curriculum facilitator at the time, Jennifer Reniger. So a cross-functional team came together. Um, we applied the APQC PPM process framework for this redesign. And that took us really from beginning to end November through July. And it was really um, a, almost a weekly uh, event of working and, and fleshing this out. Uh, from there, we provided an update to the board at the September meeting uh, about the proposed redesign process, shared that with you all received input from there. We've been um, burning the midnight oil, so to speak. Uh, departments programs were identified and placed on a deployment calendar. That happened in September. And then at that point, um, my department, and I'd specifically like to make note, I believe she's with us this evening, uh, Jill Palmer in my department has been my right hand in um, bringing these to life. She's actually done more of the heavy lifting than I have. Uh, so it's important to note that both Rod and, and Jill have been instrumental in this process. And then that takes us to our final component, uh, where program leaders then bring the OSRs to cabinet, and that happened in the month of November. From the perspective of who's coming when, uh, we do have a deployment calendar. It is important to note that we are hitting it hard out of the gate here uh, with six, and it will not be until April will, where we will see as many, uh, where we have seven come through in that regard. So this gives you kind of a, a sense and uh, a perspective as to who's coming and when they're coming so to speak. The process itself, so what's it mean to go through this ongoing systems review? Well, w there is this planning and preparation phase, and that's where the program leader uh, works with my department to discuss this redesign process to help them understand kind of what the purpose is, how it's going to work, uh, as well as for us to understand the work of the program, to be standard in getting this input from the program themselves. Then at that point, the program leader works with members of their department as well as my department on goals, indicators, measures, and accompanying data. And that's really kind of the, the heavy lifting of the work, so to speak. Uh, we're there to partner with them and kind of help them through that process. From there, on the technical side, uh, we build this out through Excel, where we capture this summary of um, these key strategic measures, or what will be known as KSMs, another acronym for us to add, um, where we can disaggregate for each goal. Uh, the results of these Excel files then link into a PowerPoint template and program leaders then complete, kind of fill in the blank, if you will, of the, the major sections of the PowerPoint. And this gets us that standardized product that you, you uh, received for this month's programs. Finally, then, we get to the presentation point, And from a presentation side, the program leader comes to Cabinet and presents their ongoing systems review. Uh, cabinet then um, questions program leaders about certain pieces that come through, uh, discussing um, the findings. And then at that point, um, at the end of the month, we then compile all those materials um, for the month, preparing the summary report that you've received this evening. The components within the ongoing systems review that happened, uh, we really can think about this in three phases. We have the background of the program, which includes some of the mission, vision, and collective commitments type of work. Then we have issues of alignment to note specifically, uh, paying attention to SP5 and then uh, what we've termed the Leithwood model, and I'll speak more about that momentarily. A description of the program is designed to convey what is the program designed to do. It may seem quite elementary, but we found that it's quite important to put kind of a, a frame around what is the work of the program. And then additionally, if there are any issues of compliance or compliance-related um, regulations that the programs find themselves working within, we felt that important to know. The program timeline gives a quick Twitter-like version of where the program was at with goals, indicators, measures, when things came in, when things came off, how things have changed, what brought them on, what, what accounted for the change. Uh, then we go to the KSM summary. That's what we might think of as the dashboard. That'll be the main piece that we'll highlight this evening, though we can certainly go into more detail if you like. Then the KSM details reflect uh, those measures that the program leaders have identified as want, need, wanting or needing to provide a little bit more context on or additional results for. We then present a historical track record of the strengths and opportunities for improvement that the programs have identified over the course of their longevity. Uh, we bring in a finance summary and discussion, bringing that in from our budget book um, out of the system. And when we think about the model, um, this represents what we referred to a moment ago as the Leithwood model. And this, after we visit with the program leaders about the work of the program, 
we put this model in front of them. And the relationship of the arrows is not um, of, of note for us in this discussion. Actually, what we bring this forward is to get the program leaders to think about these boxes as stakeholders out there. And we really kind of beg the question and say, help us understand how you work with this box or how this box works with you. How do you influence this, this area or how does this area influence you? And so that allows kind of um, an additional way for us to cover the basis of understanding the work of the program, but also to help the program leaders think about the work of the program. And an interesting thing occurred. This was only really through trial and error. Because we had a more technical alignment tool initially um, that was, was geared more on the quality end, and it was really complete, but it was overly technical and didn't really help people think through the process. So we had used this ourselves as a program of, of thinking about our work. And we realized that when program leaders expressed um, their relationships with these variables, with these boxes, with these units, they were really talking about the relationships they have. And that's when we had our breakthrough moment, not only as an independent program, but also as a unit facilitating this work with the programs. Because when we captured the relationships and, and got people to express them, we could then frame the relationships uh, and think about it as it relates to the learning model. And when we think about how relationships fall into the learning model, what do we see? Well, we see that relationships incorporate high expectations. That means program leaders or the programs have high expectations for those relationships, and the relationships have high expectations for them. At the same point, we can see that relationships influence the feedback. Programs provide feedback. Programs give feedback. It is then from there that we get to the green, which is about goals and success criteria. So how do we take the relationships that we have with what we know they expect of us and we expect of them, along with what we know from them in terms of the feedback and what they know from us, do we incorporate those into then the clear goals and success criteria? And it's those clear goals and success criteria that represent the content coming forward in the ongoing systems review. And so it was really powerful, I think, um, as a facilitator, but I would also contend for the participants to think about the work of the program in this way because it really makes a connection explicitly between the work of the program and, and the learning model in that way. It's a very uh, effective organizing structure for us. Uh, for the presentation this evening, um, six programs, as I previously noted, will be brought forward. Uh, the way we're going to do this is uh, I'm going to put up their summary sheet. Uh, the summary sheet is the one pager that they write to with strengths, opportunities, and next steps. Uh, and then I'll also have the KSM summary sheet, kind of the quick dashboard there. Uh, the program leader and supervising cabinet member will be joining me at the podium. They should all be in attendance this evening. And uh, the board members will ask questions around the OSR and the work of the program. So we're not going to have a formal walkthrough of the points. We're going to just kind of open it up to you all. Uh, to your questions, comments, uh, and go from there. Um, for this initial presentation process, we've looked at budgeting about 45 minutes. Um, however, as noted, we'll plus delta that at the end and kind of see how that works. Um, and with that, if there are no questions on the process piece, I think we're ready to go. Okay, uh, Nancy. And while I didn't note it in the content piece, uh, just publicly to note, so we have then kind of a structure piece. We have the OSR summary. That's what we're referring to this page as. And then that's followed up by the KSM summary, kind of the dashboard. The link in the upper right uh, does go to the full OSR PowerPoint with all of those other details as we noted. Just a, a general question to, to frame it because I think it will be helpful for the rest of the discussions, but could you, Matt, probably just review um, how the red range, yellow range, and green range were determined or who determined those in each of the categories? Right. So the, um, the ranges were um, probably uh, some of the, the more difficult part of the work because the ranges were really established measure specific. Uh, those happen uh, primarily by the program leader, though with some consultation uh, if they requested it from our department. Um, uh, it really kind of depends upon 
measure by measure, uh, whether that be an industry standard, whether that be a reflection of past performance. Um, in some instances, we used new ways that MSIP-5 will, would be calculating them. We tried to replicate that out with some modifications for some achievement-related pieces. Uh, so really, it was, it was a pretty intense process, measure by measure. Um, I didn't seek the feedback of all program leaders, but I would contend that was probably some of the more difficult work, but it was, it was between program leader and, and um, our department. And this is, I'll point to some Nancy, you're the first one for this. <laughs> this goes you. with all, the, all of them. As far as comparative data, um, I mean, there's fabulous data in there, but I know there's none of them did we have much comparative data. And I know this is the first run through, and maybe that's a plus delta that we need to talk about. And if it is, put it on the parking lot and we'll do that. But I, I just was wondering, because you have some great information on lost time work and lost work days, which are incredible. Do we have a feel for how that compares? And you may have an answer. I just, I just, just an issue I thought was. Yeah, we do. Um, actually, when you look at the red, <laughs> yellow, and green, like for the, for the uh, lost workday incident rates and total um, injury rates, the yellow area signifies the averages from the state and okay. national data that we collect. So we can use that as the as the benchmark to gauge our our performance. And the other areas that I um, develop the ranges for are mostly process related. Thank you. That's Nancy, go to your next, uh, go to your uh, KSM slide, if you would. And, and it says zero in, and I just don't know what number I'm looking at here, zero in, in liability exposures. Liability. One would think zero would be good, but <laughs> this bad. This is um, one of the process. Um, measures that we developed and as we walked through what our department does you know, with Matt and his team we kind of looked at ways to uh, kind of look towards the future and look for areas of growth and these were some areas that that I identified um, and so basically we are kind of starting at zero and and it's a process where we get to 50 percent of completing that process we're, we're still in the red zone when we get to uh, where we're between 50 and 75 will be in the yellow. But uh, the first step is to kind of identify what that process is going to be and how we're going to attain a certain goal. And then these measures um, are how far, what percentage of that we have achieved. So a bit of a learning experience and a, a process development for you. For right. Charles. I guess the question I have on that specific question would be, I'm guessing then that, that when we look at risk management again, that those ranges are all going to be different because some of that process you're going to hopefully going to be completely done with. And so mm -hmm. either that would drop off as a, as a uh, KSM or, or the, the ranges would be reconfigured. Is that the idea? Exactly. Yeah. And that's where kind of that ongoing piece. I saw in. this in a, so in a number of these, it was kind of like, how far are we along? And, and hopefully within six months we're going to be there exactly. on some of these things. And so why would we continue to? Yeah, so to play that example out, uh, so if, you know, and not knowing how long the process takes, but let's say the process gets established and the metrics are identified and targets coming off of that uh, around um, accidents regarding vehicles on the premises, then we would think there would be some ranges that had happened with that specific uh, thing we we're trying to affect. So absolutely, yeah. Okay. And, it, it, and, and I guess, and, and Jerry talked about a comment in the plus delta, I kind of have a comment. I don't know if I should. Is it about the process, the whole process? Well, about overall? this, this about particular. Th about this one, address it here. Well, it's just a comment, I, I guess, and, and that is that in looking at these as a board member, and we've, Jerry's already kind of talked about it, and, and Dr. Prater's talked about it, I don't read minimize accidents, vehicle premises, and understand what that is as a board member. I don't see incident rate all types and understand what I should be looking for. Does that make so sense? So more detail around what that is, whether that be expressed there or accessible in another way, more detail around just something that's what that, to measure. that is going to tell me what that what that number should look like because instead of having to drill down and say, oh, we want incident rate all types, we want that to be higher or lower or, you know, uh, along with the benchmark, which I think is a great idea, but, but I just don't, some of this I just don't see and I 
I see gray now. You say that's great, but I don't know why it's great. That's why they put the colors on for you. Yeah, exactly. All right. Very good. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thank you all very much. And I apologize. I'll I will introduce uh, program leaders going forward. Uh, next, we have community relations um, and Mr. Mays. I'd like to say I'm very excited to be here today. <laughs> <laughs> At least you're honest. <laughs> Questions? Mr. Ritter. Uh, under next steps, why has somebody told you we need to privately fund a communication campaign to address future needs? I, I, I just always wondered in communication is extremely important from uh, to our whole community and we talk about that consistently and teachers to parents and the teachers to students and board to community and admit why would we privately want to fund communication I I, I just see it as essential an essential piece and I'm, I, I just don't understand why, because I, I think uh, we've, we've crossed the bridge of depending on others to communicate for us. We've said we need to communicate for ourselves, and, we, and you've started that plan, and you've developed <coughs> websites, and we've done a lot of things for ourselves. I, I'm not sure what, if we feel like there's something Thing we're missing and we're not communicating with them. I mean, I'm glad to partner with people because that's, but I, I think we ought to, we ought to be a big part of, of that and try to partner with people rather than sending you or your uh, department out to seek funding for that. So it's, uh, I just didn't, I didn't know where that came from. Maybe we told you to. I don't know. And well, we did, um, absolutely you did six years ago. No, <laughs> just, Right. Actually, this stems back, and there's an explanation for that, and it, it does bear some additional detail, but if you recall six years ago when we did the initial strategic plan, I partnered with the um, Foundation for Springfield Public Schools to inform the public about some key issues around the strategic plan. Those were those KY3, mainly those KY3 ads. We did that for a couple of reasons. One, we felt like it was important that those funds not come from the communications budget because a lot of people quite frankly would take issue with expenditure to buy time on the air but we also felt like it was very important to get that message message out about our strategic initiative so it wasn't replacing any um, of the existing communication budget it was an addition and we are working on that partnership again this year mr. Renner to launch the new strategic plan with the dashboard by the way so we we're fortunate to partner with the Foundation for Springfield Public Schools again um, to be able to achieve that. So this, in a sense, addresses an OFI in this particular um, OSR. Uh, we dropped a little bit, not a, a tremendous amount, but over the course of the last few years on the public perception of planning for the future. So that will be bolstered by us getting out there and saying, here's what we're looking at for the future. Here's what's important to the community community including class size uh, competitive teacher pay all the things that we're working on right now at the strategic plan so Lee. This, this is more maybe a philosophical question but it applies here because you do the most of it dealing with a lot of the old surveys that we do right and we continue to report satisfaction surveys of 80 percent are satisfied 61 right. percent are satisfied and the breakdown of that between I think we asked satisfied and very satisfied. Correct. And, and as a continuous improvement district, I guess I question, uh, I, it's sort of like my wife coming to me and say, how do I look? And I say, fine. And that does not go well. Right. <laughs> and so, I mean, I, I don't want to be just okay or satisfied because we're doing what we should be doing if we're satisfied. And I guess, how, how do we incorporate some of that? And I'm not sure I have an answer. How do we raise the bar? How do we raise the bar and 
Dr. Ritter probably knew this was coming, but I, I, I just, and I know it's not gonna be 80%. I understand you're not gonna have 80% and very satisfied, but to me, how do I get from a stakeholder being, you're doing okay, to you're doing exceptionally well? And, and how do we report that? How do we, because it's like going from MSIP 4 to MSIP 5. Mm -hmm. You raise the bar, so our numbers won't look as good, but we started at a different level. And, and, and I'm just asking, because yeah, I, 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 I want to go to excellence, I don't want to be okay. Right, and I, I think I can explain, if, um, if you recall in the dashboard in the new strategic plan, a lot of numbers exist beyond overall satisfaction. So we start to drill into your satisfaction with class size, your satisfaction with um, the quality of instruction. All that's on the, the dashboard to see, but we're also very concerned about obviously what we call the home run question in the survey is how do you think we're doing? It's a legitimate question to ask. We do combine overall satisfaction as a number. I would tell you that if the very satisfied dropped, it would pull that number down as well. So there will be a time and place as we become more sophisticated with the dashboard to say, hey, we need to move from somewhat satisfied to very satisfied. But we also have a series of satisfaction questions across, across a whole range of areas in our district that are quite frankly yellow in some areas. For instance, one that's addressed in this particular area is the, um, uh, the budget needs uh, reflect classroom. You know, that is largely a perception slash communication issue that we take head on. We don't feel like that number is where it should be. So it's not a matter of shying away from quality, but it's also putting up you know, that big number versus um, a series of smaller ones, so. Yeah. This is just something uh, to throw up as you see the different areas and um, really this department encompasses, like uh, doc, um, Mr. Renner was saying, so many important things that we do. I wonder if it's time to start thinking about um, splitting the responsibility of this, of this department because it seems to me that there's communications telling our story um, you know communicating in a variety of ways I mean even since I've been on the board the whole social media website that whole thing has just you know taken off and then really a strategic planning kind of visionary piece and then there's the community you know what we're trying to do in the community um, and really creatively look at you know, not just the partners in education anymore, but how do we really engage our community and our schools? And so, you know, I just think it's something for us as a board to think about, something for the administration to think about, is a, because I really do think that you get different kinds of talents and, and different kinds of perspectives in each of those areas. And I think each of these um, areas individually are important enough that, you know, we might want to start shifting some focus and resource to, um, those different areas so. I would just add something a little bit unique I know we're on a time frame here but we've gone from eight FTE to four I know. and I and part of that flexibility that you're speaking to I believe has been reflected in our decisions which is one FTE has been moved from community relations to choice and innovation that was originally our FTE but we moved you know we wanted we thought that was where the emphasis should be so that expertise has been moved in an area that the district needs to address we also did the same with the website. Um, we moved it over to IT where the expertise was in existence. So in a sense, we've been doing those things and I think Dr. Ritter and I had the same discussion around what's the future of uh, what that department look like. I do think it's important for it to remain flexible because the advent of social media is just one example of how you, you're gonna have to bring a variety of expertise in at different times. And one other area that's related to um, our department is that we made a decision to not invest in full-time FTE but call on the expertise as needed to have the flexibility so that it may be a uh, graphic artist at one point, it may be somebody to engage a particular issue um, that we had had the flexibility to do that. Well, I just, I just think the, the planning piece is the piece that I'm, uh, that I think we may be growing to a point of really needing um, more focused attention both in strategic planning, facilities planning, you know, how do all those different plans that we need to continually have and continually look at and revise, you know, how do we have someone who's, you know, or, or a group of people that are very um, trained 
you know, in all of those, you know, in that area to, to conduct those right. kinds of facilities, I mean, or in those kinds of, that kind of planning. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that that's something that I think sure. we may and be it's a little, it, the reality is the strategic planning from the community relations standpoint is really about stakeholder input collecting that data from our customers then in turn obviously we're going to work with Steve's department on facilities planning we're going to work with Dr. Goodman on um, academic and uh, the, the academic side where we need to be so it are it already is a collective effort but I certainly agree that that's probably an area that there will be growth in it's great and exciting to hear you say that by the way because innovation is really hard to figure out and innovate innovation is something you respond to based on your st stakeholder and what their needs are. And it's kind of interesting how exciting that you get. So, okay. Other questions for Mark? Mr. Hosmer. Uh, quick question on the goal to address uh, measure one, address areas that need improvement in strategic plan. Number of action plans developed to address areas of improvement. It's five and there's a green range of five plus. Why is that on there? What is what are we what are we talking about there? That's an evolving area. Those are the action plans that you'll find on the strategic plan and actually placed on the dashboard. So that's the talent management implementation. That is the athletics and activities, the learning model. Um, those are the action plans we identified this year as the strategic action plans to be placed on um, the the broader strategic plan. We call them the key drivers, obviously. So. What we're trying to do in that area is ensure that every year as we evaluate what our strategic initiatives are going to be for that year, those action plans are reflected on the strategic plan for the public and the board, obviously, to be able to, to look at and emphasize. And then goal three, the develop and maintain quality school partnership. There's one measure under that, which is a satisfaction measure. Is there, has there been thought to expanding that measurement so that we can have some uh, uh, some more measures under that goal the quality school partnership goal yeah yeah uh, that is an area that we have monitored in the past through satisfaction uh, both our partners and our uh, the schools involved with partners and the partners program is actually a little complex the partners in education is technically a chamber of commerce program people don't realize that but we are a partner with the chamber so uh, that's gone through a transformation over obviously the 18 years that i've been working with it we have a a, a person working in that area lisa langley um, she's not a full-time ft but she works with the partners and what we've done actually i think we've improved the partners program all the partners that are accepted as official partners are connected to a specific strategic goal in the district so the numbers were somewhat inflated in the past because if you supplied a pizza to some school, you're a, a partner. Uh, we've focused in on more of the academic and strategic nature of those. And to answer your question, uh, indeed, those will be enhanced um, during the, the coming years as we continue to revamp partners and look for partners like Bass Pro and WOW that we have uh, with Wolf and emphasize those types as well. So it's, it's really quantity over quality and we'll have a series of measures around those. Quality over quality. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> uh, it, I was it, doing so well up in the now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the other thing, and, and maybe this is a question for you, Matt, but one of the things that you talked about, the purpose of these things is to guide budget uh, or to be a help in, in budget. And, and so I look at this, and, and Mark, I think, could make a very strong case to me individually that cutting, his, cutting him from eight, FTE to four FTE was not a real good thing, um, and he needs more FTE. Where on this sheet is that going to be? Is that going to be uh, seen <coughs> by Reflected. by cabinet? So there would be the. So we do have the um, key opportunities for improvement piece, but within the programs themselves, and I, I don't have everyone's memorized to know what Mark has listed in this specific part. But in the um, um, historical track piece of the strengths and the opportunities for improvement, if there is a financial implication to um, a piece coming through there uh, with, a, with um, an OP, I guess it could be with a strength too, although I don't think we've seen any with strengths come through, 
um, for expansion or what we think it might be. We've asked program leaders to ballpark what we're talking about. Um, so that could be a process improvement that we could note that back on the summary sheet as well. Um, but that would be one spot um, per each program's um, full slide deck. And I think you've got other programs that have even more detail on that than other examples. Yeah, so yeah. you want to see another? Sure. Good. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Mangus. Uh, next will be um, Health and Wellness Services, um, Gene Graybill and Jeff Rogers. And Dr. Hackenworth, I'm sorry. Two questions. One's the easiest one. Uh, Medicaid, is that in this department or is that somewhere else? I, I didn't see anything about Medicaid payments or Medicaid process or anything. And that, that's more curiosity than anything. I was just, because I know it's a huge dollar. Well, that, for, for students, on the student side, there are two types of Medicaid reimbursement that we receive. One is for direct uh, services for OTPT, speech language, and then we also have income through the school district administrative claiming. So that is noted in part of the piece here as far as our um, financial piece where it, it will say that that's part of our income. I, I guess I missed that one. Uh, the second one was dealing with health risk assessment, which I'm a huge believer in HRAs. Um, from where we are to where we need to be with 3,500 people doing an HRA, which is, I know, difficult to make it mandatory, but incentivizing or something, um, thoughts on, on how that might be, because I think it's a great idea. I just don't, if you, what thoughts you were thinking about with respect to how to incentivize, whether it's insurance or issues with that, because I know my prior life, we saved big dollars. <laughs> utilizing the HRAs in our health care costs? That's a great question. I think it's imperative um, as we develop and implement wellness strategies to have all of our workforce participating in the health risk assessments. Um, the story that we wanted to tell was that in uh, 2007, we had 237 employees that participated. And each year, that number has increased, which uh, we could have put that as a green because we have increased uh, close to half of our workforce is participating, but we put that in the red because we want all of our employees to participate. Uh, a couple of thoughts and ideas that we would like to look at to do that is to use the health plan uh, to make it mandatory. So whether there was a, an insurance premium that could be implemented, um, a lot of uh, employers are starting to go with that model to encourage employees um, to get involved in wellness. Yeah. It was either in here or in some um, responses I got back to some of my questions. And I want to thank all the staff for getting back to us. Um, I know a lot of us spent the weekend going through this and getting our questions to Dr. Ritter and staff. And then I got all my questions answered. So I really appreciate that. But there, w I think, Jean, you may have given um, a dollar amount for how much an obese, how much um, increase to our health care costs, obesity costs us. Did I see that somewhere? Per employee. Per employee. Mm -hmm. It's like $2,300 or something like that? Yes, ma'am. That, that information comes to us from Mercy, and what they're looking at is potential cost to the health plan. Um, from the numbers that we received, um, out of the 1,600 employees that participated in the health plan, we have the potential of $6 million that uh, could hit the health plan in claims. And so those are numbers that are just aggregated out uh, based on health risk. But on the obesity, uh, out of the 1,600 employees, 500 of our employees uh, were considered obese that had a, were over 30 on their BMI. And so that broke down to about $2,000 uh, per employee that could hit the health plan based on obesity. Then do we strategic, uh, because I think this is something as a board we really need to look at in terms of mandating um, this participation because if we want to continue to provide the kind of benefits and really the excellent benefits that we do to our employees at, really, at no cost to them, 
we've got to look for ways to to, to find savings um, or to incentivize he healthier life choices. Do we offer like a Weight Watchers or um, you know access to those kinds of programs? And is there an incentive or are those paid for? By we do. Um, I've been able to use some of the wellness budget dollars to offset costs. Um, we work with vendors, whether it be Mercy, uh, Cox, uh, Weight Watchers, or Jenny Craig, and we also have a, uh, a program on site that we offer. Um, our nurses are really our biggest cheerleaders. They do offer and help us support some Biggest Loser mm -hmm. programs. Uh, as far as incentives, I think the board passed the Fitness Center Reimbursement Program, which was huge as far as incentivizing employees to get involved. And um, the, the first step to being involved in that is to, uh, you have to do a health risk assessment. But what we're really trying to focus on is how do you get those employees that are not engaged, uh, either through incentives or using um, some other methods to get them plugged into wellness. Are there aren't any ongoing like programs? I know like my employer, I'm participating in a don't gain more than two pounds over the holidays kind of thing, and I get a thing, I, I get a, I get a thing every Ooh, that's week. A, that's a great yeah. thing. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I mean, it's those kinds of things to keep it, and I get a, you know, I get a portion. I mean, it is just kind of a fun little way to, you know, it's a virtual thing, but do we do any that kind of thing? I mean, that would be cheap. Yeah, we have a lot of programs as far as, we use a, we have a newsletter that goes out, uh, just promoting different programs. Uh, September, the month of September, we gave away the pedometers to increase em employees' awareness of getting out and being active. Um, there's a lot of different programs that we offer, um, but I think what we're trying to do with wellness is get it to outcome-based as opposed to program-driven. Um, if you look at wellness programs across the nation, about 98% of them are gonna be program driven which is a lot I think we've done a really good job but we want to be that two percent that really has that impact on our health care expenditures well it, it, I think it's very important and, and but I but I do think there's a process here and and habits that have gotten into take time to get out of so you know I certainly applaud the progress that's been made I think that's really important to you know, pat yourself on the back for progress that's already been made, and understand this is a progress, and this is a this is a process that'll continue. Uh, the guy, question about, you know, we have the percent of obese students, and fifth grade. I look at it, fifth grade, forty percent of our fifth graders are obese, and that's a unfortunately, it's not a shocking number. Uh, it should be a shocking number, and and uh, but that measurement even though I think it's good information and, and an, another measurement that I saw and I think Chris maybe would ask a question in an email I'd seen number of students with chronic health concerns can you talk to me about why that is a m measurement that's got a red range yellow range green range when it doesn't seem like we have much of an impact or can have much of an impact on the number of kids that have a chronic health concern yeah I, I can actually frame that not that one specifically I'll let Ms. Gravy will speak to that, but we do we do have kind of these measures that come through across all the programs, and part of that reflected kind of the coaching and the discussions we had when asking the programs to think about their work and saying, you know, what are we doing that reflects the work, and it, it really kind of connects to that learning model idea in terms of the relationships related to high expectations and effective feedback, and it was a function, um, um, so in terms of like, why is that ours, it's because it, it falls within the scope of where um, our people find themselves kind of doing the work and that reality in. And so like if that was one along with um, number of medications administered, <coughs> that that is in the daily work piece that's coming in. And so is there from like a process piece or do we have a sense of, of what that number is? We felt that this is probably the, the one way to kind of bring those in. Now maybe that those pieces may fit in more of a program description, you know, kind of some, uh, almost more of, a, of a, a leading number to understand the work of the program, X number of staff, distribute X number of medicines. Um, but that was, that was somewhat intentional to try to, to make sure we had more in scope out of the gate. 
and then specifically to that? Well, one of the reasons why we included the obese information is because I regularly get requests from the public to say, what are we doing as far as wellness for our students, and what are we measuring? I get requests for their VMI ranges, and there's many grant fundings that seems to be the flavor of it nationally and looking at what can we do to reduce obesity. And so one of the things that we've been collecting is, is the BMI information on our students. So we've done a number of things to improve and working with different departments like nutrition services and the changes that they have made because the public wants to know what are we doing from the school system's perspective as far as making positive changes. So what has nutrition services done? What are we doing in health education and physical education? Are we doing transitional activities? Um, so that we can report here is the reality of the picture and then we presented this to a number of people in the public like the YMCA who said oh my goodness we're shocked with that let's go after some grant funding which they've done in order to help us to come up with some more strategies as far as improving health and wellness for students and for families so what can we do outside the school day so that was the reason for including that when we talk about chronic health conditions, and that was a great question, Chris, that you had for us, because it's um, what we've seen is an increase in the number of student population. Every year we're seeing an increased number in students, but what I wanted you all to see is not only do we have an increase in students, but they have significant health issues that are going on. So how do you say whether or not that's red or not, or green or yellow, because that is increasing, and we do need to have the resources to help support them. So that was kind of a difficult thing as far as to choose whether or not this fits in a red zone or a green zone. But then you also have to think about staffing and supporting that because of the numbers of, of special health care procedures that are required because of those students with those chronic health conditions or special health care needs. So that's why that was included. Um, just a quick question. I noticed that your key strengths, highly qualified staff. And then in looking through all your information, it's mentioned in your unfunded priorities and in your historical track that there's a need to replace 2.85 SU. I'm just wondering why that's not in the key opportunities for improvement, because that's something that would be very clear to us that that's an, a need or additional SU. I, mm -hmm. I think it's just a function of what we've put on the sheet from a process piece. We kind of, we viewed the full product as the, the full slide deck so to speak, so we knew we had it there as you referenced it. I think it's just an oversight that we hadn't put it here. This one was really about kind of the, the present ones running right off that KSM data, uh, the, the summary piece with the details. Um, we didn't, in designing it, think about dropping the historical responses in as well. We could certainly make that process improvement. Well, and just I mean, I could pull it up if you'd like. The only point I'm making is that as a board member and looking at budgets, and need that would probably be that is where I will probably go back and look at your opportunities for improvement your next steps and what is your need to to meet those um, to, or to meet your goals so that's why that is I think there, there are two things here that we've just talked about that sort of summarize why this process I hope is going to be so good we've looked at HRAs we've looked at at the number of medications in the obesity in kids and we've already started talking about budget and how we're going to address it. And that's the whole purpose of this process is to take this data and to realize how we can spend money to make a financial impact or where the needs have gone up that we ne may need to spend more money to catch up with, with something. And I, these, those were the two things on all these six that, that stood out the, the best for me. So, good point. All right. Thank you very much. I believe next we have um, athletics and activities. Uh, Mark Fisher and Dr. Harrell. Who wants to lead it? Mr. Renner. I, well, let me just say I'm glad the ongoing system review is at the board level because I know there's been a committee that's been dealing with this for three or four years and it never it never got to us because there it was decided other things were more important and we still may decide other things are but I'm glad we've gotten this so that we can put all of this start putting all of this um, together um, 
one, I think the key strength, that's what I've thought all along, the grade point average all the way back to Edsel's day when we um, would talk about dropouts and uh, graduates and GPAs and we know students who are involved in activities consistently are there. And we've never, we never as a board, I guess, um, um, decided, I think our middle school area presents us with the greatest opportunity for improvement. I think we're minimal. I think we've done a minimal effort there and we could have the biggest bang for a buck with those students. They're ready to join something. We just don't have anything for them to join or be a part of. And we just had high school people talking to us about exciting things that middle school kids would be jump, you know, uh, wanting to be there. So doing some of those exact same things where we have nationally recognized programs at the high school level, we just move them down to the middle school and then those programs, I think, will even be better because they won't have to start at ninth grade. It's like saying we're going to start English at ninth grade and, um, you know, good luck in middle school. We're not going to take any communication arts. And I somehow we get them to national level and think what we could do if we started them in sixth grade. So I, I'm glad to see this is coming and I like the recommendations on the next steps. But I, I also think we need to look at um, the opportunities because we'll have to, I think that's gonna go right along with some things we're gonna be talking about in the next month or two. If we're gonna do this, you have to have the facilities to offer it and then you also have to have a budget line item that supports those. So um, I'm, uh, I'm just glad it's um, gotten to our level because I, I support everything that's here. It's just never gotten to us before. Mr. Whitty. Um, I think in our conversation yesterday, Dr. Goodman, we talked about, as I was looking at these reports and we went from health and wellness to and that these are brought to us, these reports are brought to us and we refer to them as silos. This is, this is about this particular report, but we just talked about obesity. And now we're talking about athletic activity and how much further down the, the line it should go and 40% obesity at the fifth grade level. That it gives us a chance to create a bigger conversation about these programs. And I'm sure you talk to one another at Health oh, yeah. and Wellness. I, I know all of that. <laughs> all the time, <laughs> all the time. But from a needs perspective, whether it comes from facility need or whether it comes from do we need more time in the day in order to tackle some of these major, major issues with the health of our students, activity, keeping them engaged, getting them to graduate, um, I'm glad to see that it brings us uh, even though we're having to do six of them this evening, it really proves to me just how uh, interrelated they can become and maybe even more effective we can be with these reports and, and getting some good um, uh, planning coming from them from a fiscal standpoint. What do we need to have in place? Yep. I, I would add that um, from the design team side, it became apparent to us when we were getting close to seeing this completed that that could potentially be the next level that it's not so much about program or department review, it's more of almost an initiative integrated um, um, functional area around an issue, student health, staff health, you know, whatever, and what does that look like? Um, we have more than we can bite <laughs> off with the present ongoing systems review at the program level, but we'll certainly consider that for major redesign going forward. Several questions and, and comments. One, uh, to back up, uh, Mr. Renners, I think the whole middle school thing is an opportunity for us to, uh, that's being missed uh, from several from, from several things. And, and I appreciate it, and I think we've known some of these numbers as far as those who participate and those who don't. Yeah. Grade point, attendance, ISS, discipline. Uh, it just seems to me that may be one of our best intervention strategies that we've got to get 
and, and I think part of the problem we have is when we think of this, we think of football and we think of basketball, and that's all we think about. And it's way bigger than that. Nobody lightning doesn't strike when I say that, but you know, <coughs> if I was in Texas, I'd probably be struck by lightning. <coughs> uh, yeah. But I think it's much bigger than just the idea of athletics, even though I think it ties into wellness and all that. Kids that are engaged are obviously successful or, or do better than those who aren't engaged. And whatever we can do at that early level, because I'd love to see, I'm not asking to do it, but I would think there'd be some correlation for those students that are active and participating in middle school. Does that translate to high school participation also? I mean, logically, if you're an orchestra and band, would you be an orchestra and band if you're in high school? And I hope that that translates a progression to do that. But, but I, I think, <coughs> bottom line on that middle school, I think we got a great opportunity from an activities and athletic standpoint to really make a huge difference um, in some of the schools, particularly those where we have low participation uh, in some of them, because I think we can make a huge difference, uh, a huge difference there. And, and my, my second one is maybe a, a word of caution as we look at this. Um, you know, pat yourself on the back for your, you know, healthy play initiative. You guys, that's a fabulous thing. I think we need to be very, very careful that at some point we as a district have to take some ownership in facilities. I, 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 I'm concerned that we, can, we will continue to go to the public or private funds to do anything that we want to increase facilities because it has an athletic connotation to it. And that's just, I just think we need to be careful with that. I, you know, as I said, fabulous program, fabulous initiative. You guys did wonderful things, huge success. I think we need to be careful about how many times we tap the well and how many times we do it. Because I think we do have a responsibility as a district to improve, whether it's improve the band room, orchestra room, track field, whatever it is. I think we need to be looking at it from that perspective because we do get such a huge payback with, with kids participating. And so I, that's just a word of caution. I, you know, I mean, I'm not throwing water on that fire at all because you guys did great. But I just think that's something there's a board and a district we need to be careful with that at some point we got to take ownership in our facilities. Which goes back to, to our communication and community relations uh, piece. And amazing uh, how that works, doesn't you it? You know? So that, okay. I mean, great job, but I just I want to be careful with that. But that's, we tap that well too many times. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, next is Ms. Kathy Gross and Mrs. Marty Moore with Professional Learning. Who's that? Dr. Goodman, this, this didn't come through, by the way. The board is saying that the link, the link, the link didn't, didn't work. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh, no. And it, I tested them all. I mentioned those by you Sunday. Sunday. Okay, so we're going to go through the next 30 minutes. And <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, is there a certain part you'd like me to flash up? Um, I'm sorry about that. I thought I tested all links. Got the summary. I'm sorry? You can go back to the, the summary. summary. Oh, go okay. Back to, go back to where we... Okay, Dr. Frederick. Huh, it's a quick one. Um, in, in your next steps, your your opportunities for improvement next steps, you, you mentioned something that I think has been an ongoing request for a number of years, and that is for uh, step-up coaches for all new hires, whether they're brand new teachers or whether they're coming to our district from another district. But um, So that's in your next step. So is that something that, and, and I may be going back to a question I've already asked, is this something that we would see come forward as a priority in the budget? from the Department of Professional Learning? In the time I've worked in the department, it's been a budget request each year. It's just that it doesn't hit the priority list compared to all the tough decisions you guys have to make. So it will continue to be a budget expansion request um, unless we um, quit getting the request. But regularly, we get requests from leaders. But that is something that you've prioritized from your department. As is obviously a big need. Yes. Okay. I think that it's um, an opportunity to expand our services, but we don't want to expand at the cost of um, 
lessening the quality of service we give to the people who we already serve. So we wouldn't want to do it unless we were able to have the expansion. And this is more, you guys do a tremendous job. And, and I'm not, this is one, in my opinion, one of the more important areas that we, we deal with. My concern, my question is, I don't see a red, spouse, red spot on here. <laughs> and I don't, don't take that critical by any means. My thought is, where do we push the envelope, go to the next step, as opposed to everything is all green and, and I know you're doing a great job, so don't take that as a negative from that standpoint. I'm just asking philosophically, how do we push to the point that we have some red things that we're trying to achieve? I think that if you were to listen in on any of our department meetings or daily conversations, you would see that we are constantly asking ourselves those questions. And um, we have some yellow that we're looking at pretty critically. So um, specifically on the phone survey, there was a section of yellow that teachers feel that their professional learning um, isn't as relevant as it should be. So that's something we're looking at and it's a tough, um, that's one that we had a lot of conversations about how to put the range. And the reason that we put it yellow instead of red is because it was a one-time question and so we um, want to watch the trend on that. And so it might be a range that we would consider changing next time. But for right now, we feel like it's a yellow. And we are, we've already talked to our PL advisory team about that question. We've also thought about the needs assessment we're about to do this year to think about um, how we might look at um, being more specific about what is and is not relevant. And then um, with the coming of the Common Core, we feel like there's a great opportunity for it to feel really relevant. <laughs> so we think that that will go up. Yeah. I'm gonna just throw in two cents worth here as somebody who is newly joining the district, but you're familiar with the work that APQC does and Kathy's department was a national benchmark. I'm coming from a district that received the Baldridge Award and we looked to Springfield Public Schools for that model, for that step up program. And if you've always had that and it's been in your backyard, there's sometimes a tendency to uh, take it for granted. And I don't mean anybody here, but it just is a part of the landscape here. But this is a program that people all over the country try to replicate. So it, um, I would think a, a bigger challenge is that they have been able to sustain that over time. I think when you're at the very top of the heap, it's hard to uh, invigorate that and make it fresh and meaningful every year. So, yeah. The only comment I was going to make, and um, of course we all hear and we see data to support the excellence of this program, but one of the things that I've heard um, from teachers is they would like to have more ability to guide their professional development opportunities. And I guess that would be number two, teacher involvement in developing professional learning opportunities. So I, it's encouraging me, it's encouraging to see that in a yellow because it seems to me to reflect some of what I've heard in talking to teachers um, in, in various situations. So I think, you know, some of the uh, moves that we've made over the past few years in terms of the online learning and those, I, don't, I can't remember the, um, what is it? 360. What is it? SPLS, Site Professional Learning Systems. Yeah, where they go and they get to choose what they would like to have more assistance with and do that online. I mean, I think those are the kinds of things that um, the more we can help people, uh, and I think the, the new evaluation system that we're going to at the state level will help maybe guide some of that professional learning that way too, where people can be steered to those areas where they need, you know, that extra support. So uh, I, I was kind of glad to see that piece yellow because I've heard that in the ranks. So. Other questions, comments? Mr. Trotter. Talk to me a little bit about some of these ranges. I, I see Chris talked about teacher development, 84% and that's in a yellow range because we want it to be above 80. And then we go down to number four, professional learning opportunities have classroom relevance, that's 73%, and yet the red range is zero to 72.9%, so that's bumped up into the yellow range because of that. Um, 
and then seven, 94% agreement, and that's also yellow. That, I, under, I know it's not random, but boy, it sure, it seems kind of strange. As Dr. Goodman mentioned earlier tonight, I think this was probably one of the more challenging pieces of the process of doing the OSR. And I have um, Dr. Yonke and Dr. Quirk with me tonight, and we had some lengthy conversations about how to set these ranges within our department, and it wasn't haphazard whatsoever. Um, that 73% is one that we argued over for several minutes, and um, I would say that what really caused us to land there is because it was a one-time question on a random phone survey, and we have just that one piece of data so far. So um, that's one thing that weighed into it, whereas some of those other ranges that you'll see, we have trend data and we have national comparisons to set the ranges by. So um, the other thing is that the relevance, I think, is um, one that unless we're able to ask very specific questions, it's going to be hard to move that because um, relevance to most teachers means exactly what I teach. And sometimes they don't realize um, that the big picture is relevant until they've learned more about the relevance. And so um, that was another reason we put it, the range lower on that one, because it's definitely one of the toughest ones to, to look at and to make those connections. But it's definitely one that we're displeased with and working well, on. Well, I'm not talking pleased or not pleased. I guess I'm just, I mean, just, was it just a, you put 72.9 because the answer you had was 73 and you wanted to put that in yellow because you only had the one question? Was that the? I, I think that some of the conversation we had recalling how we argued over it, I think that um, it was hard for us to know where to put it honestly because we didn't have any national comparisons. We didn't have any trend data for this one. It was just one question. But um, I definitely think that it's one that on SP5, when we talked with um, Mark, that's one that we're watching on the phone survey. And that's another thing we did intentionally was that on this OSR, we use the things that are measures within SP5 as well, because we wanted it to be aligned on both instruments. Thank you both very much. Final uh, report. Uh, final program this evening, uh, we have special education, and that will be, uh, actually, let me see. Um, Ms. Amy Krause and uh, Dr. Harrell. And uh, I will point this does contain um, uh, XE and uh, the K-12 uh, special services. Just one item. Questions, comments? Seeing none. I just have a, a, a clarification on two terms that you use in your details and within your option for improvement. And one, you talk about the graduate fault score data, and you talk about higher ed slash total employed. And then in your key opportunities, you talk about higher ed or competitive employed. Can you define the differences in those? Yes, they talk about some different measures. They're looking at the higher ed piece as well as just continuing ed, so those um, more um, tech opportunities where they are going on and getting some training, but it's not necessarily a four-year college. Then they also look at the competitive employed versus the supported employment, those students that are perhaps at the Springfield Workshop or they're at ARC and they're doing supported employment. So they're measuring those different measures in that manner. But, the, but it doesn't consider continuing education as higher ed? No, they separate it out. And that comes specifically from our special ed performance profile from Gussie. I think since we've um, had a lot of um, dialogue about um, ECSE um, recently, that this percent, and I don't know, when I started going through this, I, I don't know, the red, yellow, green, I, I just looked at this 
where we were in that percentile. And percent who entered preschool below age expectations was 98%. And then within a age expectations by the time they turned six was 44. I think that's a huge improvement and tells us that's what we ought to be doing uh, as I look at those two categories. Um, and uh, behaviors, um, same thing, whether it's red, green, whatever, that they were within age expectations, but they needed to learn appropriate behaviors. Uh, we still have half of them that need to learn, and I don't know, we may have half of those who are not in ECSE with uh, needing to learn because that's been identified as our teachers with the behavior thing. So uh, I, I just think those are solidified to me what we've been doing and talking about and why it was important to do um, what we did. And the other thing is the incident rate under IDEA to that we're at 11.14, which is um, uh, I, we're identifying the students who need to be identified because there's a number of districts who way over identify and that number is d at least double plus that and it's not in the water as some of them say it, it really isn't and so they've over identified students and I think we are we are very careful to identify those who need help and deliver the services and not identify those that we uh, don't have a disability and we can still help them succeed but we don't identify them. And our, compar I'm sorry. our comparative data is very supportive of that when you look at the districts that we compare ourselves to. Um, the one district we compare ourselves to that consistently outperforms us, over identifies, um, their identification rate is at 14.4% of their population. So they're almost 2% over the state <coughs> average. And so um, they're the only district of our comparative group that outperform us on math achievement. Uh, same question I've asked it a number of different people and, and that is the justification for the different ranges. So for example, in early childhood outcomes we have percent of students who are functioning within age expectations by the time they exited ECSE. 46.58 percent and that's a red. We go down two spaces to percent of students who are functioning within age expectations by the time they exited ECSE in the acquisition of, and use of knowledge and skills, 44.29 percent that's a green. Um, you talk to me. I, I'm assuming, maybe I'm wrong here, but I'm assuming that these are these things are uh, objective measurements that can be that are normed and standardized. Is that right? They, wrong? they come from our special ed performance profile set by DESE, okay. and so and when it's green, are they benchmarked as well? We met the target when it's green. And okay. so that's why those numbers are, are so markedly different. It was extremely difficult to set the targets um, because we have such a range, right. wide so range. Are, but these are benchmark numbers. Yes. Okay. One thing, and, and this is, I guess, be plus delta or whatever, but, but <coughs> when I drill down from this, I'd certainly like to see that on the next page that, oh, by the way, this 4429 is green because it's benchmarked, and which I, I kind of looked and I couldn't see why that was done that way. I'd certainly like to see, you know, if we have that ev supporting documentation or numbers that, that we have access to. That's taking notes. Ms. Cowan. In terms of the uh, graduation rate uh, for our um, students in special ed, that's concerning to me. Uh, can you address that a little bit and what plans are underway to improve that? You know how sometimes the state zaps you? We met graduation rate, um, but they applied the four-year standard. Um, so they switched on us after the data was turned in. Our graduation rate for students with disabilities was actually 84%, which was above the target step for the state. Um, I got it back, and it was in the 70s, and so I started calling in July, and they're like, oh, well, we're going to go ahead and apply the five-year standard to get you ready. So the kids that had made it through in four and a half or five years didn't get counted for us. And I think, uh, and again, which is unfortunate. Yeah, I, I think this is just a, a very philosophical uh, waxing. But you know, we have to get to the point of allowing students to get through school at a pace that's appropriate for them, whether it's accelerated, whether it's extended. I mean, because we know, 
I mean, or we wouldn't be sitting here that we believe all students can learn. But we were kidding ourselves to think that all students can learn at the same pace and learn different content at the same pace. And it's frustrating to me that in a district that is trying to individualize instruction as much as possible for students, we are gonna get penalized for not having a certain group of students pushed through the system it, just to push them through. And so, you know, I mean, if that's something that we can lobby for at the state level, but. I mean, we have an obligation to look 21. Right. Right. And we may decide. But we, but we get counted against us when they go. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Years. I mean, it, it makes no sense. The, the very target, you know, goes against IDEA. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we may decide we don't, we're, that we're, we're not going to pay attention to some of the state targets, and we may ask you to develop okay. some of our internal targets. Be happy to Kind of like what we've done with yeah. state targets. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> Very good. Thank you very Thank much. You. Now we have Russ Gump. Dr. Goodman, you managed yep. to uh, get us through in one hour and one minute. I'm pretty impressed. Oh, okay. I was thinking 120 in my head. So. Yeah, and, uh, and let's talk about. I can't, I can't set ranges That's a long. green. <clears throat> I think, yeah. I think Mr. Goodman has gotten, has gotten some feedback uh, already in some of the questions that have been asked of him and of different cabinet members and staff and some of the concerns that have been raised. Let's focus, are there any other specific things that we want to do differently, either in the board meeting presentation, in the data that we received? I think we've hit that a lot. Um, in, uh, in other, what else? I mean, Ms. Callum. And if I may just hedge just yeah. one bit, we've already been working on the, no, the December ones that have been in process. So whatever we come up with, if we determine that it can be done or how to address, I'm not sure how much I can promise on what's right. been produced up to this point, we'll have to kind of take that item by item. Sure. For And I set that up for the next one, so you may not see it in January. Couple couple things that I have. Um, you know, is there a possibility of splitting these presentations between study session and board meeting? So you're not getting all of them at once. So you may be getting two at a study session, two at a board meeting. That was an idea that I had after I spent a lot of time this weekend looking at these things and didn't get all the way through the data. Um, I think what I've heard and what I wrote down is we need to have some idea of how the ranges are, you know, are determined. And I think some of the indicators are, if that's the right word, but you know, why are these things important? Are they industry, are they best practices? Are they tied to SPS 5? You know, it would be just helpful to have some background. How, how detailed do you see that? Like rationale, <laughs> like is Ooh. the goal rationale enough or? Pardon me? Um, I guess when I think about it, they're kind of they're kind of chunked, like the goal, the indicator, and then the measures are all the lines. Yeah, I don't think it needs to be detailed, but you heard a lot of questions here. Well, why is this why this? Why did you do that? And why is this this? Right. And how do I know that this is important? And somehow we have to be able, as we're reading through these, and evaluating them on our own because we're not going to be able to ask all those different questions here. I mean, right. I'm sure all of us had many more questions. Um, and let's talk about that one a little bit um, because I, I, I may be concerned on the other side of it. We, we just said that we want to now we split them up because we're getting too much data at a session, but we want more data. And I know you didn't mean that. I, just I know you didn't know. mean that. But do we, at some point, do we as a board have to say, give us all the footnotes on each one of these, or do we have to say, we trust the cabinet level to set those appropriately and, and go with it? And I don't know the answer. I don't my, know the my, answer. My thing, oh. but I, I might add also, this will be the steepest, it's been the steepest learning curve for us. Yeah. This will be for you all as well. So, I mean, it's going to take us till May to get them through. Right. Now, if there were a wholesale change in a program, like going forward, like you'll be able to dig into everybody's goals this time, and maybe the improvement for next year is only annotate changes in goals. Like, yeah. you know, like a, there may be a lot of heavy lifting this year to footnote, not so much going forward. Sorry to interject, but. Let me answer my question and ask the question at the same time, because I was going to go to that. The first time is going to be tougher because we don't understand some of it because there are questions with some of them that Ms. Grayville answered, like the one on a chronic illness. Well, that why we measure that one? Well, it makes sense as it dictates resources. I didn't think of that. That you know, when I first look at it, why are you measuring that, or why are you measuring 
our level of, of IDEA, well, it does have an impact. And, and so some of that data that, so I, I think once we get over this first hump, yep. I think it's gonna help be clear that the second time we look at it, it may be scarier, I don't know, as far as what questions we ask coming up. I kind of see it as, as when Mr. Chodas gives financial re report and we have this big spreadsheet and, and we can drill down at it if, if we choose, but to be noted or highlighted, you know, he has us take a look at these things, these things, and why couldn't this, there could be annotations on, on this type of uh, asterisk that, that took us back to some maybe more in-depth part of the, of the study itself. So far, we're the ones who are asking for it. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think what I'd like to say, and kind of follow up what Chris said, I, I think there's nothing wrong with dropping it down to the next layer or even a layer below so board members at their leisure can drop down as far as they want or not. And, or and they trust well, the but information. I've, heard, I've had, I've had it, yeah. feedback from board members that we got too much data and not enough time to look at it. So and I, I must also just, I'm just play I'm the playing devil's advocate a little bit. And I would I throw out right. kind of a practical side as well that it's taken everything we've had to get these to this point. Now we are relieved a little bit, um, and we could certainly extend on that. But I, it be, it would be um, uh, disingenuous for me to be able to promise that we could drill every item. I, I see how that well, would work. I guess but in terms of, I, I'm not suggesting that. I guess I, I, but some of these ranges, I think it would be nice to have a. A hyperlink or something to say, you know, this is how we got these ranges, so that because this is also. I don't think that's going to be reasonable for us to expect. I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. Well, I think th th this is this is an internal document for administration, <coughs> Kevin, but it's also external document, and and you know, community can see this and go through this, and and I think it needs to have some relevance and some ability to understand which went back to one of my questions about you know some of these goals you need to understand from the language in that goal what the numbers reflect and and uh, so so I, I would like to see some of that and and, and I, I like the fact that it's kind of layered so we can see the the one page but then you can go down and, and go a little further a, a couple other th I'm sorry well, I, just, I thought the bigger concern though was that we just didn't we, we didn't get it we didn't get the information Maybe until we got our board docs information yeah, on Thursday or Friday. I thought the point was, this is good. Just can is there some way to get it to us yeah, we, a we're week talking. out? <coughs> yeah. Uh, so I guess when I think of plus delta, I think of a third column of prescription. I don't have a prescription necessary for each delta, so I can make note of what maybe Thank what you. that might look like, and cabinet kind of talk about how to logistically do that. And then. I had two other, I think two other comments, maybe three. Uh, the financial considerations, I'd like to see, um, and, and that can just be in a parens, the, the total dollar and total budget of, dollar. percent of total budget so that I can see this in a kind of perceptual manner, what we're talking about with this instead of, and I like the number of students served and cost per student, cost per school, but I think you could very easily say, you know, that's $35 million and it's 11% of our budget. It allows us to sometimes when we're talking about something that's 0.05 percent of our budget, and we spend a lot of time on it. Maybe we want to spend the thing on a 20 percent of our budget. Uh, I'd like to see that uh, and FTE uh, with that item. I'd I'd like to see that just and I think that can be just. You're saying on the summary report on itself. This financial considerations. You know, 85 FTE involved in this these two programs. The other thing I think is important as we go forward um, is that the language in the key strengths, the key opportunities improvement, the next steps, I'd like it all to kind of have a similar, I think it's important to have a similar tone to, to be cognizant of tense, to be cognizant of whether it's first, first, second, you know, uh, with those. You already got that. You got that information too. Right? Yeah. So I think I think that's an yeah. okay. punctuation. Yeah, thing again, that one with Delta. I'm not sure prescription-wise yeah. on that, but we'll. And, and this is more just comment for apply. I mean, tons of data, and I'll just be honest with you. When I looked through this, I didn't look at anything but the reds and a little bit at the yellows, which I appreciate that. <laughs> I mean, 
I, I, I looked at the greens too just because it was the first time I ever looked at it, ever seen it. But it, to me, it just really highlighted, I, I, I like the visual side of it so I don't have to, I, I can focus. I can prioritize what I think we need to be looking at and not worry about the other ones unless somebody raises a question or something. I, I do like that, that, that and we've talked about that many times. I, I, I really think that helps me as a board member focus on what problem issues are out there so that we don't have, because I mean, if we're going to get this many of them, it's going to be hard to, to look at every one of them, and I, yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. I, I really like the layers of data because that allows me then if I want to know more I can look and find more and um, so I appreciate that I again kind of go back to the, the more data is fine and of course I'm kind of crazy about that and I like to, to read that and go through that but I just think the additional time to do it is and I think that's been discussed but that would just be a suggestion yeah. that I have. We've had a very thin uh, margin of error I know. on these so there's out of the gate. Um, and I, I <coughs> say I appreciate getting these because um, I, I don't, in my, in my opinion, this is not a matter of trust. If, if it's just trust and you all do it and I don't need to understand it, then uh, I think it's more understanding for me than it is trust. If I'm supposed to understand what's happening in community relations and strategic planning, I, I need this document to be able to intelligently talk about it. If I don't need to understand it, don't give me any report. I, I mean, don't take your time, don't take my time, just if it's nothing I need to understand, don't give it to me, you know? And so I, I really think for the first time through, and I was the one who said needed more time, I, I think if we, can, if we can get this to two pages and then that's fine, it's just need I needed more time based on my schedule, so that was the only thing. I, I think this two pages, and I like the fact that I could go further if I wanted to, or if I looked at it, because I, um, I, I, I think it's excellent for the first time through, and I'm excited we're getting this because I need to understand it if I'm going to vote on it, and we'll have budget times, and you'll be asking me to do some things, so. I need to. I need the understanding. Uh, I, I want to tell you. I think it's a phenomenally uh, good uh, attempt, especially for first pass. Not an attempt. A good completion. A good uh, job for for what's been the first go through uh, of all this. And I, I know staff has spent tons and tons of time on it. Cabinet has, and we have um, looking at it. And this is what we've been asking for for quite a while. I think ever since I've been on the board. I was very pleased to see the fiscal note and the unfunded priorities listed in these because that's what we'll be talking about at budget time. The price tags on some of the opportunities for improvement I think were, were, are going to be very helpful. Um, and I, I've raised it a couple times. I, I, the, my only concern is that the work that would be involved to get too much detail for us takes away from your primary jobs. So I don't want to see more people putting more work into something to give us, you know, too much that doesn't affect our decision-making process. Um, and that would be my only caution, my only delta in this is, is um, and it's hard for us. It's obviously hard for us as board members to, to take in all this. Um, but anyway, compliments to everybody. And we'll probably go ahead and do a plus delta maybe after each, each after our next months too. That's a good idea, yes. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to help us at first and hopefully help you all. Yeah. And, and if I may, um, I would just like a little more detail or if there were thoughts to call out the, the presentation process itself because I only heard uh, Mrs. Cowan's comment about maybe splitting between sessions. But, I mean, if did it work to just flip it up, not really have any talking and just have yeah, members comments. available? That work? I think so. I mean, it was, I, I thought it was <coughs> have the board meetings more often. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. All right. Uh, let's go on to action items for separate consideration. 8.01 is the staff selection and engagement uh, consulting services that we tabled at the last meeting. Mr. McKenna. 
Thank you, Dr. Prater, members of the board, and Dr. Ritter. Uh, good evening again. This is um, the second time we've been before you. The board will recall, as Dr. Prater mentioned, that last month the board voted to table this item so that administration could return with some additional information with regard to some specific questions that arose at the November uh, regular meeting. Uh, specifically, those uh, surrounded the predictive validity um, of the instruments that we're proposing for teacher and staff selection. Um, basically, how do we know that the use of this instrument will translate into making better uh, selection decisions? And to help answer those questions, we've done a couple of things. First, we've provided you some information in, in board docs, uh, some research that's been conducted by the proposed vendor here, which is HumanX Ventures. Uh, that includes some white papers that outline uh, just that, the predictive validity of uh, other school districts that have used these instruments and uh, the research that's been done and the results that they've seen. We also have with us tonight uh, Mary Hayes, who's a senior research analyst from HumanX Ventures. She's been very brave through our OSR process. Uh, she comes tonight from the Omaha area to assist us in answering any additional questions that board members have. So uh, at this point, I, I would be happy just to open it up to any questions that uh, either Mary or I can address. Mary, why don't you join the, at the podium, please? And I think Mr. Hosmer made the motion to table it last night. Do you want to start? Do you have any specific questions? You want to Sure, I'll ask you a question because you came all the way here from Omaha, and it would be a shame if you just left without <laughs> answering the question. I'd feel terrible. No, I'd feel terrible. I'm sure Park would feel terrible. Uh, if if you would, and, and, and Parker was kind enough to give us a, a lot of research material, and, and boy, a lot of it was pretty technical, and so um, if you would just kind of talk to us about uh, the research behind uh, uh, the product and and you know where it comes from and kind of what it's shown yep I sure can so the process that we follow is a qualitative as well as quantitative process when we design any of our interviews what we look at is we first start out by looking at the field that we're interested in creating an interview for so we do job analysis so we go into the teachers find out what it what is it they do on a daily basis Teaching, of course, has been around for a long time, so there's a great amount of literature as well. And so we, as well, look at the literature and find out what makes a good teacher, what makes an effective teacher. And as you know, through the literature, there's a lot of disagreement on what is effective. And so we start to narrow down through the focus. We create focus groups with outstanding performers in the field. So this is our qualitative phase. So we gather as much data as we can to understand the different themes that make up a good effective teacher. And some of the themes that are on our teacher interview are mission. A mission-driven teacher is one who is altruistic, that has the passion to help students learn and grow, um, as well as empathy, caring and compassionate. So we incorporate all of those themes into um, our pilot interview. And we go out to school districts and we ask them to nominate their best as well as some of their lower performing teachers. And we interview them with a battery of questions um, for the current teacher interview. We started with around 102 items to get down to the 51 items that are on the tool currently. And what we do is we then move into a quantitative phase where we look at what differentiates the top performers from the bottom performers. And so that's how we design the interview. And then our interviews are continuously evolving so that we find out from our partner school districts what's working, what's not working, and we work with them to understand is there something specific in your district that is different somewhere else. And most of the time, there's only a little tweak here and there but we make sure that it's valid across. Um, to address the validity concerns, we have um, in the white paper, as well as three current dissertations um, from different clients, that client partners that we have across the United States. One is currently in, the United, in Illinois, in Schaumburg, which is a, um, a, a district comparable to yours. It's about 25,000 students as well. And what um, uh, an individual is looking at in that district is teachers hired with the HumanX Ventures tools versus teachers who are not hired with those tools in comparison for student achievement. 
in the NWA NAP um, RIT growth scores in math, science, language, and reading. And looking at the data, he has not completed, he's in the process of writing, but we partner with him and we ran his numbers. Our research team um, gladly um, assists anyone who wants to work on data using our tools as well as their student achievement. But what we have seen in his data is that it, there is a statistically significant difference between those hired with our tool than those hired without. What we can tell you is that looking at the data on teacher evaluation, how principals evaluate teachers is a lot about how they hire teachers and they go with gut feeling. They go with, um, there's, little, there's little variability. They um, see, they've seen them in, as a substitute and they think, okay, they're great. But when they get into the classroom, they not, may not be. And so the gut feeling is how the district did it before. And what we can say now is that there is a difference on how the students will achieve based on our tool versus what may have a lot of subjectivity in it. Did that answer your question? It, 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 and I got one, another question. You talk about going back and kind of going through research. How would we determine two years from now, three years from now, that this was effective for us? Because if we're, if we're looking at hires, if we use you for three years, then we've got three years of no data really to compare it to because we've used you for that thing. So, so how, how would we go about designing something to see what the, what the bang was we got for the money we're spending? One of the things I would say is currently, not only here in Missouri, but across the country, teacher evaluation is broken. And we see that teachers are evaluated at high, ex at each high achieving, however their students are low achieving. And so there's some disconnect between why are all the teachers doing really well but their students are not? And how do we get the evaluation of teachers to a place where we can say that it's a valid measure or a criterion measure that we could use from our tool to predict. And so what I would say is that we need to work with you to help use what the, the um, Department of Education is coming down and saying, this is how we evaluate teachers. We can say, okay, these teachers who were hired with this tool, you'll have a pool of teachers who are not hired using this tool. We can look at, are there differences on your evaluation from the teachers hired versus those teachers who are not hired? So we would be happy and at no cost to you to partner with you to do this research. And I would just add to another uh, kind of uh, angle to look at. We, we currently collect data on a number of metrics relative to retention. Uh, we, we know that one of the reasons teachers uh, choose to leave the profession in the first five years is because it wasn't necessarily a, the right fit to begin with for them. Uh, and, and ideally, with the right selection tools in place to begin with, we have a higher chance of selecting a teacher who is a right, the right fit for the profession. So uh, you know, that's an example of another metric that we could compare pre and post implementation to determine if we've made an impact in selecting someone who's ultimately going to be uh, ideally a better fit for the profession. Dr. Prater. You mentioned uh, one in, in your studies, two, two case studies, I think, you, that were discussed in the white paper, and one is a district called Marksburg, which is a smaller district of Springfield, but you do, you provide it, or you cite evidence from the study supports the observations that students achieved at levels, higher levels of recommended versus highly recommended. But did this process, did this district have a process in place to identify, I mean, prior to using your product in which they identified rec recommended teachers versus highly recommended? I mean, what, did they have a process in place yes, before that, you came mm -hmm, on board with it yes. in which they did this? Mm -hmm. They, um, that study is outside of, most of the, the research in that paper was outside, that was client um, driven. They, a lot of times what happens is the superintendent or the assistant superintendent is going back to get their dissertation, to write their dissertation. And so they already have the data at um, their location and so they have already 
have the teacher were selected and they already had the outcome data of highly recommend, recommend, not recommend. Um, so in that, in that study, it was outside of what we would say would be best practice. And would you say that this could also be utilized in hiring recommended and highly recommended principals? Yes, we do have a, we have a principal interview um, and as well as a special education interview, um, which um, has different similar themes to the teacher <laughs> interview, but it is um, more in depth because of the results orientation as well as the resilience and um, other qualities that a special education um, individual need, uh, teacher needs. And is that a piece of this? Yeah, the, the contract that we're contract. proposing tonight includes a differentiated uh, screening assessment for teacher, special education teacher, principal and assistant principal, and uh, frontline front employees, so all of our support services employees, and also non-educational managers. So our leadership team outside of the educational <laughs> arena. So depending upon what uh, job that the applicant is applying for depends upon which of the uh, initial survey screenings they will receive. That's, that's that correct? correct, yes. Karina. Um, and in talking with Parker, and make sure I'm correct in understanding this, that he, I was thinking teacher in-depth interview form B, teacher in-depth <coughs> interview form C, now he says it's teacher in-depth interview form A. That, that is, is but now is that really the first thing they do? Because as my understanding, uh, an in-depth interview to me would be somebody sitting there with people interviewing them. Is there this step one, which you told me was style profile builder? Okay, everybody does that, style profile, but that's not the in-depth interview. That's okay, that's before. good. I mean, because that means I'm on the same page you are. So I understand that now because I think the in-depth interview now you're saying there's 51 questions that you're going to train and um, personnel here to be able to ask not only ask the same it's not ask the same questions anybody could ask the same question but to evaluate the answers so there's interrelated inner uh, related reliability on their answers is that that's really step two Step one's everybody does this style profile builder. Step two, you have a structured interview process. And my concern, Parker, my concern was we were gonna take a bunch of principals out of leadership positions that we were already concerned about them leaving the building too much, but he said they can deal with that and, and be able to do it. And I appreciate the fact we're using cu probably current employees so that as they get, people get through step one and then step two, which is the structured interview, then they probably are still gonna be interviewing with a building level team. Um, and so how do we, because I think one of the concerns and uh, in talking to Parker is that we, we have all these people applying, so how do we get down to where when they go to the building level, we've el eliminated some of the people? I mean, is there a, if you're doing the style profile builder and uh, I don't know how many questions there, but you score 20 and you, do you, don't, you don't go to the structured interview, I mean, do you, as human X give us this thing or do we set what we feel like needs to be there? Is that ours or is that your recommendation? Um, what I can tell you is the, the style profile builder for the teacher is um, what we would consider the tickets to admission. It's 11 of the 17 themes that are on the um, full teacher interview. And so the, every candidate, every applicant would take that um, and then we do have cut scores for that, um, and um, we can discuss those, um, but we can also set them for your district. Um, it's, we have 
across the country cut scores, we can have just Springfield cut scores, we can have elementary cut scores, we can have, um, and w we are open to working with you. Um, we have districts that um, they've moved their cut scores up because they want the even higher select. Um, so it's a part of the process. Um, there's stuff that happens prior to they have to fill out the interview or the application, the reference checks, all of that stuff. So it's not a you're out the door. If a if it what we always recommend is that it's a piece of the puzzle. That it's not, hey, you're out. You didn't do this score means this. So we always say that it's only a piece of the overall picture of what you should consider for an applicant. Oh, I and I, I think. Maybe because I, I still have questions about the validity because it to me doesn't in reading the white paper it's just a matter of taking uh, looking at it compared then to the teacher evaluation later on which could be which is not could be which is subjective you know so I, I'm not sure about the validity but that's just the my I guess it really shouldn't be a minor part. It's not valid. We shouldn't be using it. So, you know, I still have a question about about that. Does it measure that? But I think the fourth part, which Parker reminded me of today, that we never really hit on, which is another real positive, is that everybody in the staff would be surveyed based on each year. We would survey Oh, and the satisfaction yeah. survey, and we've never done that before. We've done surveys of groups, or we have school, but we've never done that. So then all of a sudden now we're creating, uh, I think that's a huge piece of this that is a very positive piece that you're going to survey all staff about their feelings um, about this whole process and well, I think that's an important piece of data and and we do as well because you have to understand what the climate is within the organization to understand how to select into it you have to know how your your staff are engaged how they are satisfied um, do they feel that they're recognized do they feel that they're in included um, all of those are part of the climate survey the impact or the insight X survey that um, every building will go through and we come out to the the school buildings and we don't just hand the, the survey off we come out and we work through action plans to figure out what are the things that you want to address in this building in this building in this building and then we can work with you a year later to see hey did they come did they get better did they get worse what are your action plans what are things that you need to improve on yeah. I was just wondering um, does your company just work with school districts or do you work with a variety of uh, companies? We work with a variety of companies. We have our educational education division has been um, five years ago Human X Ventures bought Ventures for Excellence and Ventures for Excellence has been in the education realm for over 40 years. The business side of it, we, um, our home office would be in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Yep, and so we work with um, hospitality, we work with manufacturing, we work with medicine, um, so we work with higher ed as well. So it, would it be safe to say that this is really um, becoming a very accepted practice in a lot of different industries in terms of their human resources um, practices? Yes, I would say that um, it is it's pervasive through almost every industry now that they need something to understand the different qualities of work workers it's no longer just the skills but and um, it's more about the talent what is it are they going to be a hard worker are they going to come and um, feel responsible for what they do are they going to interact um, communicate with their coworkers, with their customers all of those things are becoming more and more important that would set a company above other companies. Well, that's been my, that's been, you know, my experience, but I was just curious of what you thought. Well, 
I just think that um, we want, just like there's an app for that, we want to test for that for, as a society. Yeah, we want to be able to just test everything and then make a judgment based on that. And education has um, long said there's a lot of other things out there besides a test and how you measure these things. And like you said on the research, there's a lot of different things right. out there. So um, I, I just think it'll be um, a, a journey because I, I don't know that, um, I hope, you know, I hope we hired the right people over at that desk over there. You know, they didn't take the test, but I, we think our process hired the best when we hired them. So I hope um, this venture um, lets us um, focus our energy. Um, I'm just say I'm. I just think we're. Mr. Osmer, uh, the in-depth interview will will uh, identify recommended and highly recommended individuals is that correct so there are currently there are three cuts there's not recommended conditional recommended and high, highly recommended um, the and the and the, the study the, the the school you named Marksburg the study was the recommended or was that conditionally recommended versus highly recommended um, that was on the B so that w that had basically two levels that would be above a certain All right. level. and 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 the reason I asked that because and part of this comes to you, I guess, is what uh, uh, incentive will there be to actually hire the highly recommended versus the recommended? And the reason I ask that is there was a study, I think Malcolm Gladwell talks about it, about women in, in orchestras and, and the fact that women were disproportionately underrepresented in symphony orchestras. And they do all these additions and these professional people that are picking orchestras routinely don't pick women for these parts. And they did a study where they put them behind a curtain and then had them play. So when these professionals were just listening to the music, all of a sudden women were equally represented in the orchestra. So it kind of strikes me as the interview process, and, and I agree with Bruce that you sometimes it is good for gut level, but boy, a lot of times your gut is terrible at, at telling you what is important. And, and so I wonder whether there's going to be some way to have a principal that sees somebody's highly recommended and says, you know, I really like this person, even though they're just recommended, I really like this person for my school and let this highly recommended person go because I'm assuming that's going to be perfectly allowed. Yeah, you know, again, it's a, pic a piece of the puzzle, a piece of the larger picture. And so the idea is to develop this toolkit of resources to help principals in this case or, or hiring managers to really make the decision that's best for their building, their department, their program. So <clears throat> when we redesigned the hiring process, the selection process, and the HR structure about a year ago, um, we did that with the idea that we needed resources in place to support that decision process. And there's a, a uh, assigned employment coordinator for our certified staff and our assigned employment coordinator for our, our uh, classified or those that don't have a certificate. And there's constant conversation going on between that employment coordinator and the hiring managers when they have a position open. And especially when that position closes and they talk about who they're gonna recommend. So that would be a part of that conversation. And definitely, you know, at the end of the day, um, if, if a principal or a hiring manager can make the case for another applicant, an applicant that uh, perhaps wasn't as highly recommended through the instrument as, uh, you know, the, the one they're talking about, we can definitely be flexible and, and plan to be. Wichita Public Schools, uh, I'm sorry, uses Gallup competition. And I was talking to the superintendent uh, last Friday and uh, asked him about it. And he said they have to give rationale to accept or hire someone less than. Uh, the recommend and so uh, he said he had to go to that because the research was so strong uh, for those uh, for hiring the, the people that are recommended as opposed to those that aren't and so they have to give a rationale and then they follow up uh, two or three uh, years later or as soon as possible to make sure that the uh, what what they hired was true to uh, what was expected so anyway Mr. I just thought I'd point that out would a motion be appropriate be welcomed I move that the board approves the superintendent or designee to sign a contract authorizing human expenditures to serve as the district's consultant and service provider 
for staff selection, engagement, and satisfaction. Second. Mr. Motion by Mrs. Cowan, second by Mr. Lee to approve the authorization of human expenditures. Thank you for your time tonight. Greatly appreciated. Provided us a lot of information. Parker, thank you for providing the data and the white paper. That was um, very interesting. Have a good flight. <laughs> oh. 8.02 is revision to board uh, policy GBBDA. Uh, sick leave. Mr. McKenna. Oh, second reading. That's correct. I'm happy to answer any questions again. Uh, I can take a motion. Uh, Dr. Frederick, and uh, Mr. Lee to approve policy GBBDA. Uh, 8.03 is a revision of the Board of Education policy section B. We talked about these at the uh, retreat this summer. The one that we didn't talk about that Mrs. Callan brought up um, involved the uh, board compensation and travel expenses, and I think you have that attached in BHD. Um, that has not been vetted by MSBA yet, so we would do that as this is first reading, so it would come back and possibly need to be amended for second reading if MSBA had it. Others were discussed this summer. Any discussion on any of the? That was this uh, in October. October. That was October, the wasn't it? Tax brackets. Golly. Any discussion on any of these uh, Section B policies? I'd just like to thank Mr. Renner and Mrs. Luton and Dr. Ritter for going through all of these um, on our behalf. It's just starting, Mr. Renner. I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and and I think, and you all can verify or not, um, having the MSBA information with us, has it been helpful? Has it been? Mm -hmm. it's still yet to be discussed. Oh, it's the first reading on that. All right, so um, that'll, be come for that'll come for second reading in January. Um, uh, revision of board policy, IBDIKF. Golly, I'm going to have to get some cheaters people. finally. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, we need to vote on 8.03, first reading on those policies. Thank you. Yeah, for first reading we'll vote on. Uh, I need a motion. I need a motion to. <coughs> by, thank, thank you. A motion by Mrs. Twitty, a second by Mrs. Callan to adopt the board policies listed in Section B. And then if the one that hasn't been vetted by MSBA needs an amendment, we can do that um, in the future. Thank you, Ms. Luton. Okay, Dr. Harrell. Well, good evening again. You have in front of you the revision of policy IK IKF, graduation requirements. Uh, due to the urgency of a situation that has arisen, and assuming that I do a good job explaining the process and what's going on, I would ask that the board would waive the need for a second reading. Policy IKF graduation requirements is being studied by a large committee at this time. We'll be coming back to the board uh, in the spring with further recommendations. Uh, late in the month of November, we were notified from the Missouri Department of Higher Education that our process, the process of many other districts across the state in which a student might leave the district early after the seventh semester, and we would simply sign a, a transcript indicating they had met graduation requirements. That signed and stamped transcript has been justification for those students who wanted to go ahead and pursue uh, a uh, into a community college such as OTC uh, and pursue their higher education to go ahead and, and address and use their A-plus funding. Uh, the state will no longer accept that letter. Our policy did not allow for a graduate at seventh semester. They were called an early lever. And so it's really a terminology issue. 
to allow a student to either choose to be an early leaver at seventh semester, and the reason we would still do that is because they may not want to access their A-plus monies yet, and as soon as they start, as soon as they're cal called a graduate, they have to start using the money if they go into school at all. So in order to give our kids flexibility and uh, opportunities to use their money when they deem appropriate as they wish, we're asking for this revision to IKF, and we will be bringing IKF back to the board again later in the spring. It's again individualized education. Huh? Question, Mr. Lee. Can a student graduate in three years? And what are they considered in three? Because I know there have been students that graduate in three years. Are they a graduate or are they early leavers? They're an early graduate. And in order to do that, they have to, file, to fill out an IPS, which is an individual program of study, and it has to be on file with the principal prior to the end of their, their fourth semester, the end of their sophomore year. But they're considered a graduate. Not they're, they are so graduate. They, they are eligible for the requirements. It's yes, the, it's they the meet all requirements. The mid semester, that's it's a problem. The mid semester of the senior year, that seventh semester, early leaver is where we have the issue. Yes, great question, sir. And that was the only reason we had it. We designated them as early leaver as opposed to graduate was to be flexible for them, or was there a money issue as well? There really is not a financial issue. We obviously want to. In, we want to keep our students in the building as long as we can, as long as it's appropriate and we're pushing them forward and we're, when we're helping them. So, you know, we certainly, you know, the idea is that we offer the types of things they need for four full years, but we do have those motivated students that, that want to leave. Um, but the only reason we show. designated them early leaver versus graduate after seven semesters was just to maintain their flexibility? I, I really couldn't tell you why we began designating them as early leavers. Uh, I think po quite possibly is philosophy and that we didn't want to call them graduates yet because for many years the board recognized a graduation at the end of eight semesters. That's not anywhere in, in state statute that it has to go eight semesters. That's a recommendation. I, I would, I'm simply guessing, Mr. Hosmer, on, that's been in the policy for two, two cycles probably. Okay. I take a motion that the board because of the time critical nature, waive second reading and, and approve uh, board policy IKF. Is that one motion? Yes. I'll make that. Mr. Lee, thank you. And Dr. Frederick, second. That comes into play about next week, doesn't it? Yes, sir, it does. And uh, 9.05, you need an extra paraprofessional. Yes, we're asking to. Uh, Add a 1.0 paraprofessional FTE on the local side of the budget. Uh, this will be a one-on-one -on -one para paraprofessional to work with a current student that's in the district. That student currently is on a 504 plan, uh, but has recently qualified for special education services. So the need is necessary that we switch that paraprofessional to the special education. As a special education paraprofessional, uh, it's and thus transfer that money over. However, we came to the board. Um, when you come to the board, explain to the board uh, a couple of months ago about the maintenance of effort issues, and so adding it on the federal side does cause us some issues. So we're asking to add it on the local side. Questions? Motion. So moved. Mrs. Callan. Second. By Mrs. Twitty, the board approved addition of one paraprofessional FTE. Mr. Went. Good evening, Mr. President, members of the board, Dr. Ritter. It's my pleasure to uh, bring to you this evening an action item for uh, Jeffries, and this is for a kitchen improvement uh, dealing with a, a walk-in cooler. Um, the bids were received and opened on Wednesday, December 5th at 1 p.m. Uh, the project includes the installation of a walk-in refrigerator freezer and the electrical uh, work to go along with that. Uh, there were four contractors that bid on the project. The bid uh, sheet is attached, and um, you can see that uh, Bailey, Bailey Company is the low responsible bidder uh, highlighted in bold there. Uh, ESC was the engineer that worked on the project for us. Uh, this is uh, separate from the bond project. This was not in that. This is a separate scope. This is to be completed out of the major repair. Um, the timeline of it is actually to uh, work over the uh, break that's coming up to have that installed. And one other thing I'll slide in here related to the overall Jeffries uh, project completion 
as uh, I mentioned in the last quarterly report, the overall project is, is behind schedule. Uh, what they're looking at at this particular point in time is uh, we're targeting to move the administrative areas over the break, and then it would be during the month of February when we anticipate getting the FEMA uh, section online. Um, with that, uh, it is administration's recommendation that the board awards the contract to Bailey Company out of Rogersville, Missouri in the amount of $87,102 for the base bid and alternate one. Questions for Mr. Wynn? Take your motion. So moved. Mr. Lee. Second. By Mrs. Callan to just erase it, to approve the bid for Bailey Company for the Jeffries walk-in our treasurer's report, Mr. Chavis. Thank you. If you'll look at the uh, November financial statement, uh, you'll see that the uh, revenue year to date is coming in at 21% of budget compared to last year's 19.6%. Um, that's reflective of the additional uh, anticipated 3.8 million that the um, board is aware of. Um, and what I'll probably do is uh, go ahead and, and change the budget uh, to reflect that 3.8 million um, so that I don't have to come to you each month and remind you about the $3.8 million. <laughs> um, the expenditures tracking almost identical uh, with last year. A couple of pieces of information. Um, the, uh, um, the property tax, uh, we've been that that's going to come in favorable uh, this month in December and so uh, I have have it on good authority <coughs> from Mr. Everest that he's 99.9% .9 certain that we don't, won't need to uh, have a tax anticipation note right. this year so that's good news and I'll be glad to answer any questions regarding the Treasurer's report. Take a motion to approve the Treasurer's report as presented. Mrs. Twitty. Second. By Mr. Lee. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you have uh, routine action items uh, listed in Section 9, which are the minutes, November, and the personnel elections and separations. We can approve those in one motion as submitted. So moved. Mrs. Callan. By Dr. Frederick. this point there are public comments to address non-agenda items I don't think we have any public comments any speakers that are good um, legislative report yes, well, Mr. Anderson gave us a lot of information we hope that trickles uphill Mr. Chairman, Lee. with respect to that and he did a tremendous job on that one thing I would our legislative priorities the number one was tax credit reform or the review of the Commission's report think we need to keep in mind that was for the 2010 report not the one coming out next week because there may be things in that report that we may not I mean they already talked about raising the cap back up which I don't think is a good thing no sunsets no I mean I know they're they're tweaking with wording I, I don't and I don't know if that was understood when when we when we approved the legislative priorities that was the only report out was the 2010 yes, report we so we didn't have anything else I, I just want to be careful that that's not a carte blanche with the new 2012 because it may not, not 2000, the, the supplemental report coming out because there may be stuff in there we don't agree with. I mean, I just yep. I just think we need to be cautious of that when we approve the report, that's the one we were talking about, not necessarily the one coming up okay. next this month. So, because there's differences, I can tell you there will be differences yep. based on what I've seen and heard um, in the report. So. And a reminder that our legislative uh, reception is here in this building right. next Thursday, next Tuesday, which Tuesday. is tonight at 4 p.m. We have pretty good response from. Okay. If you need us to make individual phone calls, please let us know, and we will mm -hmm. we'll do so. Uh, future issues? Any future issues that need to come before the board? I I will report back here soon and uh, it won't make any difference because it'll be after the first of the year <laughs> the the sequestration 
I've got a conference call tomorrow on that, but I won't. Any, any indicators of how that could affect us, or is it too soon to tell? If it, if it, if they let it go, yeah. significant impact on us, plus the state, which is a trickle down, not only us directly from no, federal funds, state, yeah. but funding that goes to the state will trickle down to us over and above what we'll get hit with IDA and Title I specifically. Remember, most of the state is federal money. Right. Yeah, and so yeah, we will see a significant impact if they don't resolve that. And we don't really, have, I was talking to Mr. Chodas earlier, we don't really have a dollar amount yet, but it could be, could be significant. Well, I, at federal, it's about 8%, 8.2%. For every million dollars we get Title I and IDA, we're gonna lose $82,000, so. But again, that's 13, 14, right? Yeah, that's not it just for a year. July. Yeah, it starts so, in July, so absolutely. As long as they From fix it. So we can budget, yeah, yeah that, that, very true. Okay. But it will impact the state, sure. not right. just us directly. Okay. Other issues before the board. Your financial operations report will be delivered to you as it is complete. Um, we do need to vote to go into executive session to discuss legal, real estate, and personal.